right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, the City of Providence City Council Finance Committee meeting. I want to start this meeting. It's Tuesday, July 7th, 2020. I'd like to call this meeting to order. And Madam Clerk, could you do a roll call, please? Present. 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 Councilman Taylor. Here. We have five present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Let the record reflect that um, Council President Matos is present. Councilman Guncoff is present. Councilman, Councilman Kerwin is present. Councilman Espinel is present. Councilman La Fortune is present. Thank you. Also, the eternal order is present. The treasurer is present. Councilman Miller is present. Thank you for waving. <laughs> oh, I, and I got Councilman Law Fortune. Yeah? All right. Um, I have all the council members. All right. So, um, as we begin this meeting, just want to remind everybody: as we progress, we're going to, you know, go to the items tonight on the docket. And I ask the council, uh, committee members and council members, as you know, to use the hands up option on the, I guess, the Zoom, what is it called? There's like a Zoom bar on the bottom. If your hands up um, uh, doesn't work, then just try to put your hand it out. I'll uh, put you down the list. We'll, um, and I'll write you down name and give you an opportunity to speak. I ask everybody to um, be courteous, courteous um, have courtesy to each other, and let everybody have an opportunity speak and we'll progress along as we move along in this process. Um, what I'd like to do, I think, at this time, I I guess we'd like to take, um, why don't we just uh, go to I think an item, is it item five? Can we take an item out of order, item number five out of order, have a motion by a committee member? So moved. Second. By Vice Second. Councilman Taylor, Councilman Castillo. Discussion, all in favor? Aye. Can you read item number five? Too? Discussion and potential presentation relative to the implementation and funding of a social service community unit within the public safety of the city of Providence, including a review of the UGRN mobile crisis intervention program for who? Crisis assistance helping out on the street. Thank you. And um, we have some also invited guests. We also have the administration. I believe we have Mr. Larry Mance, Lawrence Mancini is present. Is that correct? I am, sir. Sarah Savaria present. Um, I think we also, we also have, is Alan Sinar present? Uh, Sinar uh, from uh, Healthy Communities Office, correct? Oh, great. And then we also have been fortunate, I'm going to name the folks, uh, we also have uh, Mr. Tim Black from Cahoots, Operations Coordinator, present I see him. Welcome Daniel Atkinson, who is a medical student at Brown and former medic at Cahoots. Mr. Atkinson, do we see this gentleman? Oh, there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And um, we also have, uh, we also this we have Rebecca, is it Gibble or Gibble? It is Gibble. Gibble. Okay. Thank and you. All, all right. And we also have Angela uh, Bannerman Akoma. Akoma. Also present. I believe, do I see, do we see her? Oh, there. Yeah. Great. I am. So, welcome. First of all, I want to welcome everybody for for uh, coming this evening and having this conversation. Um, I'm sure it sounds like from the stuff we're reading, uh, Kofus is on front, front and center. And it sounds like uh, folks are being called upon throughout the whole nation to talk about this program that you guys are, looks like you, you folks have been doing since for 30 years. In fact, I guess you just had a latest CNN um, article about it just recently, about for 30 years you've been working on this, or putting this program together and working at this program. So I want to thank you all for uh, coming to see me. This is like a learning session. Our goal tonight is to get an understanding what, what this program is about, how the program works, and then is there a, um, an application in the City of Providence? That's why we have the administration, of course, and we also have uh, um, the Director of Healthy Communities Office from the City of Providence also involved to see if um, a program like this um, is it applicable? Uh, could it work in the city of Providence? Do we, um, you know, do we right size it? How do we size it? What's the what's the appropriate way to apply? If we do apply, what's the appropriate funding, et cetera, like that. So this is the beginning stages of it. So I want to thank again the Coots folks and everybody um, who I just mentioned is willing to discussion.
to have a conversation about this. So I'm going to start off just so the council members know, committee members, is that we're going to have the folks that we invited from all different parts of the country to first give a presentation, talk about what, what it's about. We're going to have uh, Mr. Tim Black and I believe um, Daniel Atkinson. He's they're going to do a, about a approximately 20 million, 20 minute pro, 20 minute presentation about the program, what it is, the experiences, and et cetera. And then of course, then I'm going to have Ms. Gibble and um, uh, Angela Bannerman Akoma. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. They'll have they'll have time to um, uh, give a presentation also. And then I'm going to ask the administration to talk about what, what's going on over there on their side of the aisle, what's happening over there. And then be time for questions and Q&A from members, committee members and council members. So ask council members if you just hold off on your questions and let the <coughs> folks first talk about first, okay? And then once again, when, when it's time for q and I'll have you raise your hand, I'll recognize you, you'll have the mic, you can ask a couple of questions and we'll move on, okay? And with that, um, I think I'll start off the evening with Mr. Tim Black and Daniel Anderson, I believe. Anderson, I should say. And, um, can you make sure they're connected, Mr. Kirk? And they're on, all right. And then I think they're, they're muted, so you have to. They'll unmute you. All right. So, gentlemen, you can unmute. And then I'll let you. Um, um, you have the mic. So, can you talk, talk to us about this program and, you know, give us what, what's it all about? Gentlemen, you have the mic. Sure. Um, I, Tim, I don't know. I have some statement prepared. Um, I know that you are more integral and probably know a little bit more about the program than I do, but I was thinking maybe I could just start off and give an overview, and then if you want, you could jump in whenever, and then, uh, how's that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. Great. Um, so, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak to you all this afternoon. Um, I'm Daniel Antonson, as you guys heard. Um, I was a former medic at Cahoots uh, back in 2016, 2017. I currently live in Providence and um, I am going to the Alpert Medical School this August. Um, I believe we have a unique opportunity today to improve the lives of residents of Providence, make Providence a safer place for everyone and simultaneously save millions of dollars for the city. We can do this by developing and implementing a police alternative mobile crisis response. So today I want to talk to you about CAHOOTS, an initiative that's been a huge success in Eugene, Oregon since 1989. With the help of Tim Black, um, I will talk about how this mobile or how this mobile crisis response works, how it is staffed and operates, its funding structure and budget, and provide you all some concrete data that demonstrates the real world positive effect of this program. It does so by providing a more robust safety net for the most vulnerable citizens, reducing arrests and saving millions of dollars in public safety spending annually. Um, so I think I'll just dive right in and get everyone on the same page about kind of what CAHOOTS is. So CAHOOTS is a public safety initiative in Eugene that mobilizes two person teams to respond to 911 calls involving mental health, homelessness, substance abuse, and other service, social service calls. Currently in Providence, these calls are the responsibility of police and fire. However, police and fire do not get adequate training and they lack the resources to appropriately respond to these frontline social interventions. Um, I believe it's really important that we have this discussion now as we reconsider where police are necessary and how they are best utilized in our communities. A 2016 study estimated that about 20 to 50 percent of fatal encounters with law enforcement involved an individual with mental health issues. CAHOOTS is specifically trained to handle mental health crisis without the use of force and work towards reducing instances of face fatal police encounters. Um, the CAHOOTS model provides a comprehensive solution that ensures that appropriately trained responders are dispatched to these calls and it allows the police department to focus on law enforcement issues. Um, Coots is not law enforcement. They do not carry weapons, but rather they utilize trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction techniques to help those in crisis. Uh, so Coots is fully integrated into the Eugene public safety model and serves as a third option to police and fire. Coots calls come to the Eugene's 911 system or the police non-emergency number where dispatchers are trained to recognize non-violent situations 
with a behavioral health component. They then route these calls to CAHOOTS. Um, CAHOOTS generally responds with a van that is equipped to treat non-emergent medical situations. This van is also used to transport the individual in need to long-term resources in the area, if appropriate. Part of what makes this such a valuable service is the ability to divert individuals away from emergency rooms and detention centers, and to take them to the local resources that best fit their needs. This ability saves the city of Eugene millions of dollars every year and serves the citizens' needs better. I just wanted to give a little example of what I'm talking about here. And um, one thing that came to my mind was responding to a call uh, in involving an individual who is expressing suicidal ideation. So if Kutz responds to a call of this manner and the individual is in agreement to stay safe, but they need additional emotional support or monitoring to ensure their safety, Kutz is able to stabilize their um, current urgent psychological crisis and transport them to a 24 hour counseling service where they, their needs can be best met. Um, this avoids an unnecessary costly and traumatizing trip to the emergency room. Um, I'm just gonna dive a little bit more about what CAHOOTS response looks like. So when they arrive on scene, they provide immediate stabilization in case of urgent medical needs or psychological crises. They assess the situation and they work in collaboration with the individual to provide the best care. If they need, they could be referred to a local resource where they could get longer term care. And in some cases they are transported. Um, I want to state that Coots has been incredibly successful in its response to calls. Last year, they responded to about 24,000 calls, approximately 20% of the calls dispatched by 911. Police backup was requested only 250 times. I believe these numbers show that there's a large portion of calls that go through 911 that do not necessitate a police response. Like police and fire, I believe that the Coots model is an essential pillar of the public safety system. It benefits the community by helping those in crisis. It connects them with the resources they need and it avoids unnecessarily contact with police and fire. It also comes with an enormous cost saving to both public safety and ambulance emergency room treatment. In Eugene, CAHOOTS has saved an estimated average of $8 million on public safety and 14 million for ambulance and emergency room treatment each year. So I wanna state that that's saving approximately $22 million in 2019. Um, also wanna state that these total savings is consistently be trending upward, upwards each year that CAHOOTS is in operation. Um, I hope I didn't lose you all during my little quick overview. I think it might be a good idea to talk about how CAHOOTS started next. And Tim, I think that maybe if you feel comfortable, you sure. probably better speak about that than me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all so much for giving me just a little slice of your evening to, to talk about the work that we're doing here in Eugene and Springfield. Uh, <clears throat> the CAHOOTS program got its start, you know, as, as Daniel mentioned, in, in 1989. But really, the, the momentum that led to the development of that program started 20 years prior to that. Uh, in the winter of 1969, a group of providers in, in Lane County here in Oregon recognized that the existing systems and infrastructure were inadequate in their response to the needs of the community, particularly with an influx of young people coming to the University of Oregon or who were attracted to the West Coast, you know, because of the summer of love, right? You know, a lot of the same motivations that were sending folks to, you know, Seattle, uh, Portland, and San Francisco were also bringing them to the Willamette Valley. Um, and and with, with this influx of, of people came an influx of need. Um, our, our founders from the clinic wanted to learn from the models that were already out there. And so to that extent, they ended up going and spending a couple of months living with and working alongside providers in the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. Uh, and that was where, uh, you know, our, our founders really learned about a lot about what harm reduction looked like in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, it informed much of, of the programming that we still have today. Um, after, after really spending that time learning from, from other practitioners about this alternative model that could be employed, 
our founders came back to, to Oregon and started what we called the Whitebird Sociomedical Aid Station. The first things that we offered in that resource were crisis services, you know, a phone number to call and a place where you could go and just be when you were having a bad day. There didn't need to be some profound and specific acute issue to be addressed. Your crisis could be that of social isolation, right? Uh, it need to be around, you know, other folks uh, while you're working on, on you know, X, Y, or Z. Um, and so we started to really build trust with our community as a place to go when you were in crisis. Um, we, as we developed a brick and mortar location and were able to build out our, our walk-in crisis services, we immediately became a resource for law enforcement to bring folks in behavioral health crisis, in acute um, you know, drug interactions where they didn't need the hospital. You know, they didn't need to go to jail, but they still needed somebody who could be with them through that hardest moment. And so we, we were really building this trust with public safety as, as this place to go. You know, taking somebody to Wiper Clinic meant less time with that person in custody, which meant less paperwork. That meant one, you know, one less jail bed being filled by somebody, like I said, having a bad day. Um, at the same time that we were building that trust and really fleshing out our, our services, we were all also recognizing that there were many people who couldn't access, excuse me, couldn't access wiper crisis services because they either couldn't make it to a payphone, you know, didn't have a phone in their house if they were housed, or for whatever reason, they weren't able to make it into the walk-in clinic to receive care, but there was still that need. And if we weren't going to respond in some way to them in the community, that situation was likely going to escalate and result in a contact with patrol or with the fire department ending in hospital or the jail. And so we needed to be able to get out in the community and do community responses. We started doing what we called the bummer squad, which was where if somebody's having a bummer of a time that's bad enough that they can't answer the phone or, or make it down to the clinic, they need somebody who can come out to them. So we would activate our bummer squad and that was a volunteer thing. You know, we only offered on days where we had enough volunteer labor people hanging around the clinic that could help out. And those folks would be responding in personal vehicles with the first aid kit, giving people rides in personal vehicles, um, doing everything, you know, with their own resources as volunteers. Well, we're starting to save the city money. You know, they already know that Wiper Clinic is this place that they can trust, uh, you know, to, to have, have folks go in crisis. You know, we know that, that we're already starting to reduce the number of police encounters for be people experiencing behavioral health crises. So what if we could take this a step further and really formalize that, that benefit to traditional public safety by becoming part of that infrastructure. By using the, the police line as our point of access, that immediately meant that folks didn't have to look up in the yellow pages, you know, the Whitebird Clinic crisis number, see, okay, there's, there's the bummer squad number I got to call. All of a sudden, we were on the front page of the yellow pages, right? You know, that police number was one of the first things you see. It's a number that many communities are conditioned to call no matter what is wrong, the police are who you're, who you're taught to call. Um, and so we saw this opportunity, uh, additionally for folks who were experiencing something that was so acute, so emergent that 911 felt like the only appropriate number to call, but for whom cahoots was the right response. So we, we really had this opportunity to, to build on that trust of public safety, to really expand our community-based response and enter into the public safety infrastructure in order to reach the, the broadest number of people possible. Uh, you know, we started off 40 hours a week, working Tuesdays through Saturdays, uh, and you know, um, eight hours a day. And now we're at the point where we have 60 service hours per day, covering a metro area of 250,000 people, uh, and and we're able to provide 24/7 coverage and divert 24,000 calls a year from police or fire response. Uh, you know, and, and there's there's a, I mean, goodness, I <laughs> I could keep going forever. Um, you know, to kind of talk about this work. Um, but you know, I'd like to you know give Daniel and Rebecca a little bit of time too to talk right now. Yeah, thank you, Tim, for your input and all that stuff. Um, there was one question you all posted um, that I I wouldn't be able to answer to, and I was kind of curious, Tim, how has the program changed over time since its implementation? Back that's then? yeah, that's a great question. Um, the the biggest difference, or I, I think the biggest change over the last thirty one years has been the volume of our presence in the community. When we first started in the late 80s, you know, we might only get a couple of calls a night at, at most. There are some nights where our teams weren't uh, receiving any dispatches. Um, and, and so what we've done as our services ex expanded to meet need, um, you know, we've, we've really had to be, be, get a lot more responsive. Um, and that means 
community education uh, outreach has become one a bigger component of our services over the years. Where we used to just only do response, now we are also in classrooms for every eighth and tenth grader in the school districts in our service area, talking about mental wellness. You know, talking about common mental health symptoms and even delving into things like social media hygiene. Uh, you know, we have also engaged in a really robust street outreach component of our services, where we're referred to folks who are receiving. Uh, you know, a high volume of police contact in our downtown area. And then we go and check in with them and say, hey, we noticed that, um, you know, officer said you've been getting cited for open container every day this week. You know, we'd like to kind of just check in with you about what's been going on. You know, um, our, can we have some harm reduction conversations with that individual then about, uh, you know, about drinking or, um, you know, maybe it's as simple as, you know, we know that this is something that you're not ready to quit. Um, you know, what about doing it someplace that's less visible so that you're not getting that police contact, you know, really kind of working with people, bringing them in and then and then supporting them. That program itself has demonstrated uh, a very low rate of recidivism with only 14% of the people that we contact through street outreach, having more than two law enforcement contacts in the, the 12 months that follow that that initial point of contact. Um, you know, really, I think in a nutshell, what, what's changed is uh, you know, I think just, yeah, just our presence in the community at all levels, you know, on education, on, on response types. Uh, you know, even when I started working with the program in 2010, we weren't handling 30 or 40 calls per shift. And that's what you can expect to see, you, you know, come through in dispatches for you over the course of 12 hours now. Um, so, you know, and with that, the funding has increased. And throughout all of that, we have remained our, you know, a, a municipally funded program. So in Eugene, our services are entirely funded by the city budget. You know, city council approves our expenditures and the police department oversees how that money is spent. And in Springfield, which is just across the river from Eugene, you know, we are exiting our five-year pilot and, and looking to the city of Springfield to bring up more, pick up more of our funding so that we can take some pressure off of a state grant that we have over there. Ms. Gibble, before you um, go, um, I want to let record reflect that Deputy Majority Leader Mary Kay Harris is present also. Gibble? Great. Thank you. Daniel, did you have anything else you wanted to add before I launch? Um, well, I think maybe just one, uh, talking about how Whitebird operates, um, or I mean, how Cahoots operates separate from the, the police department, but still in collaboration with the police department. Um, yeah. So I think... Yeah, Tim, would you want to touch on sure. that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, we are still operating under the umbrella of the police department in many ways. We do still use the, you know, the, the police non-emergency number as our primary point of access. Um, you know, we are dispatched over the same priority channels as regular law enforcement patrol. So there is this very direct and intimate integration between CAHOOT services and police. Um, that has been informed by the fact that we don't carry any sort of weapons for self-defense. We don't carry pepper spray or a taser. We're not wearing a vest. So when things get heated and they do on occasion, you know, as Daniel mentioned, you know, 250 times or less a year, we need to be able to get cover there when we need it. And so we have that radio that's right there on our shoulders. That radio on our shoulders being dispatched over the same priority channels as patrol also means that we can catch you know, all sorts of different call types that are being sent to patrol first, either because, you know, maybe Cahoots wasn't clear from a scene yet and a call came in and they need somebody to respond right away, but we're just wrapping up our, uh, you know, our goodbyes with somebody uh, or, or, you know, we're on our lunch break and we hear patrol being dispatched to, uh, you know, an intersection where we know there's somebody that's been panhandling kind of aggressively while shouting at the sky um, and, you know, for whom cahoots should be the response, not police. No, no laws are being broken. So we, we ultimately end up as civilian first responders who are, you know, have a front row seat to everything that the police department is doing too. Um, and we have an opportunity to provide feedback in the moment as first responders in that system to law enforcement on scene when, when they, they don't treat somebody as well as they should, or, um, you know, when they're using language or vocabulary that, you know, is insensitive or, uh, you know, could be perceived as having a bias. Um, to maintain that relationship, we have monthly meetings with our law enforcement partners where we provide feedback to each other about, you know, um, your officers were a little too gruff with that person before who showed up on scene and that made it hard for us to deescalate and then build rapport before we got a contract for safety. And, you know, the, our, our liaison for command with the police department can say, hey, remind your folks, not, you know, not get too eager about jumping that call with the fire department. There's a reason we wanted to wait before we sent cahoots in, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of back and forth. Um, you know, we have really 
constructive relationships with command staff to the point where the chief of police in Eugene will shoot me a text message with with questions you know that he has instead of trying to kind of route everything through all of those traditional communication channels. So, um, you know, by and large, the relationship that we have with law enforcement is is very productive. Um, it's very supportive. And and more recently, as we have looked at what what our program needs to do to remain responsive and accessible. We need to create more distance now from, you know, from traditional law enforcement. And that means trying to create our own point of access and looking at having our own dispatcher and our own call taker in the, in the comm system. And rather than uh, meet us with opposition on those initiatives, what we're finding is tremendous support from the city council and from leadership and public safety about really creating that, that separate point of access and standing cahoots up as its own third branch of public safety rather than some subsidiary or some, some, you know, some contractor. Okay. Ms. Gibble? Yes, great. Thank you so much for inviting us to speak here today. My name is Rebecca Gibble, and I'm here because of my proposal at the June 18th Finance Committee meeting for Providence City Council to fund a crisis response police alternative pilot based on cahoots. Uh, I would just like to say that we have an opportunity to rethink safety in our community in a way that protects our black and brown brothers and sisters and addresses underlying community needs while saving Providence taxpayers millions of dollars each year. I applaud the City Council for acting on the people's cry for a policing alternative that alleviates the devastating consequences on our over-policed, over-surveilled populations here in Providence. So CAHOOTS, as you've heard from both Daniel and Tim, has an extremely successful track record, and it's a great template for a similar program here in Providence. However, there are significant differences between Providence and Eugene that will require tailoring to ensure that the crisis response team here in PVD serves our population's unique needs. Uh, that's why today I would like to present my findings on STAR. It's a program based on CAHOOTS that launched Denver, uh, June 1st in Denver, Colorado. And hopefully what I say in the next few minutes will highlight how feasible it is to adapt a crisis response team to the particular needs of a city other than Eugene, Oregon, still based on the CAHOOTS template and philosophy. Like CAHOOTS, STAR, Support Team Assisted Response, is run by a team of mental health professionals, social workers, and medical professionals independent from the police department. Their calls are also routed through 911 dispatchers. In fact, 911 dispatchers in Denver traveled to Eugene last year and shadowed Eugene's dispatchers to learn what they were doing. Like CAHOOTS, the STAR team is not law enforcement and does not make arrests. STAR's unarmed personnel have no, have no law enforcement function or authority and offer all services and transportation on a purely elective and confidential basis to the recipients. This independence from law enforcement is the vital similarity between CAHOOTS and STAR. Of note is that both programs collaborate with the police department as I think we lost, um, we lost connection. CAHOOTS is budget. Um, if, Ms. Gibble, if you can hear me, do you want to sign off and then try to sign back on because you've frozen, if you can hear me? Let's see, so um, why don't we do that, Mr. Black, Ms. Anderson, do you want to follow up a little more on that? Then when Ms. Gibble comes, we can put it back on. Oh, I'm sorry, Ange uh, well, I'm going to Angela Banner. Angela Bannerman, um, Ancoma. Ancoma. And then we can bring back uh, Ms. Gibble when she comes back. Welcome. How are you? Well, welcome. Um, uh, 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 this fine woman is the Executive Vice President and Director of Community Investment for United Way. Did I get, did I get the title correct? You did. Great, thank you. Welcome, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Um, do you... I think we got Ms. Gibble back. Gibble, do you, uh, you are you connected with us now? I'm connected. Can uh, I can. Hi, Angie. How are you? <laughs> All right, you, you can take it waiting? over then. I'll pause. Do you mind waiting for a moment and we'll go back to Ms. Gibble? Is that okay? Thank you. Ms. Gibble? Thank you so much, Angie. 
Uh, great. So I imagine, did I cut out around when I started talking about differences in funding between Cahoots and Star? You started talking about Star and Cahoots, and then you talked about the independent nature from law enforcement. Perfect. Star. Thank and you, Mr. You Chairman. And then I just went, great. So no I'll launch from there. So one key difference between Cahoots and Star is the way they're funded. And while Cahoots' budget comes from the police budget, Star is funded through an initiative that was voted on by the people of Denver called Caring for Denver. And this difference shows that there are multiple ways to successfully fund a crisis response team. The Caring for Denver tax puts 25 cents of every purchase over $100 within Denver into a fund that supports mental health care, crime prevention, and substance misuse re rehabilitation. Now for some numbers. STARS pilot program received $78,000 from this fund for their first year of operation. This money covers the mental health clinician's salary as well as care packages distributed to those in need. It's worth noting that the Denver, the Denver Health, which is one of the largest hospital systems within Denver, is donating the services of their paramedics uh, team to STAR. So once the pilot year is over, that yearly operational budget will increase to reflect that. Uh, I believe that it will increase to around $200,000 to cover the paramedics' salary as well. But of note is that their pilot year program only cost $78,000, which feels within reach. Um, so uh, oh, I just did that. Another key difference between CAHOOTS and STAR is that whereas CAHOOTS is overseen solely by the White Bird Clinic, STAR is overseen and staffed by a coalition of community-based health provider organizations, clinics, and agencies. The community groups collaborating on STAR include Mental Health Center of Denver, Denver Justice Project, Denver Allow Alliance for Street Health Response, and Denver Homeless Out Loud, all of which will evaluate the year-long pilot in hopes of improving and expanding the model throughout the city. Right now, it's just working in downtown Denver. And this this coalition of community organizations that are overseeing STAR, I think is a real great reflection of the different needs for Denver as opposed to Eugene, which seems a little bit more homogenous and special uh, uh, rather than, uh, than diverse needs of a community. Uh, another, let's see, so like CAHOOTS, the STAR initiative has been supported by members of Denver City Council, community leaders and activists, and members and leaders from the Denver Safety Department, including Police Chief Paul Pazin, who has committed the Denver Police Department's full cooperation with the new service. Vinny Cervantes, a community organizer and the Denver Alliance for Street Health Response's point person with STAR, says police are often not the best solution to community health problems. When, when officers approach a situation, they're looking for whether a crime has been committed, he says. Whereas STARS team approaches somebody with questions about whether they can be treated on the spot or whether they need to be treated elsewhere. It's the difference between looking for treatment versus looking for punishment. Chris Richardson, a mental health center of Denver staffer who is one of two clinicians overseeing STAR agrees. Richardson says clinicians have the education background to be able to understand what someone may be going through. The goal isn't just to quell the current crisis, but also to prevent a future one. Richardson says the STAR team will guide folks to long-term resources that already exist within the community. Having those long-term supports in place means that when the next crisis comes, people can connect with those organizations instead of viewing 911 as their only option, he says. This last week, I had a wonderful chain of emails and then a live conversation with Chris Richardson, coordinator of STAR in Denver. He's really excited that the Providence City Council is looking into a crisis response team alternative to policing for non-criminal situations. And yesterday, Chris reached out to me and told me that his team was awarded a $5,000 grant from Harvard's Innovations in American Government Awards. The funds are intended to be used to help another city replicate the program being implemented in Denver. Chris expressed hope that these funds could be used to assist and mentor Providence's crisis response team. I'm hopeful and optimistic that this possibility will become a reality, and I hope we're able to continue working with both Chris and Tim. The CAHOOT system relies on trauma-informed de-escalation and harm reduction, which reduces calls to police, averts harmful arrest, release, repeat cycles, prevents violent police encounters, and saves taxpayers tens of millions of dollars annually. Uh, I'm calling on the Providence City Council to investigate 
fund and enact a pilot program based on cahoots in Oregon and STAR in Denver. Thank you so much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Gibble. If you could, um, could you forward that information um, to contact people to uh, the, the Mr. Clerk here? Um, is it Chris from the STAR Denver? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. It might be yeah. worthwhile maybe to reach out and see if they'd be willing to come to a, zoom into a meeting and talk about the program. You could, totally. I'll, I'll connect. I'll connect you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, next up is Angela Bannerman in coma. All the way to the left. There you go. Yeah. Top. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Sorry. We, can't, we can't see you. That's all. I apologize. My, my camera Problem. decided to... Um, do right now, but you can, as long as you can hear me. And I believe actually for most of it, uh, I have some slides I'm gonna hear. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. I wanna share a little bit about um, 201 uh, here at United Way of Rhode Island, which is our information and re resource referral. I think you heard some of the speakers earlier this evening about some of the um, work that's happening other ends of the country, uh, other parts of the country. So I wanna share a little bit more about what we do here um, and some of the infrastructure that we have here. Um, will there be slides for this? Mr. Clerk? Uh, yes, we can show, I have some slides from Ms. Vanneman, I go, oh. and I can show, would you like me to share those now? Yes, please. Hey, Coma, are you, the clerk will start it right now, it looks like he has the slides. Yeah. Um, can, can the, can the, can the um, folks who are zooming in, can they see the first slide? Yeah. It says help starts here in Rhode Island, everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Incombe. You, you have so, the mic and you have the slide. Great. Um, so pretty much our, uh, many people uh, are unfamiliar with the work that we do here at United Way of Rhode Island with our community serving, uh, community service department with this 201 in the point. Um, a brief overview about 201 is that we provide information referral services for, uh, across the, uh, the state of Rhode Island. Um, annually, we, we have about two, uh, close to 200 calls a year. Um, and pretty much if you need assistance uh, in the state of Rhode Island regarding any type of information referral services, you can give us a call at 201. Those uh, calls are generally, um, can be on anything uh, members of the community um, would need in terms of housing, heating assistance, behavioral mental health support. Um, we get those calls here. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, 201, 201 has been at United Way um, since 2007, and we are 24 hours a day, seven days, I mean, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. It's free. Um, confidential and multilingual. We have about, uh, on staff, we have um, call specialists who speak Spanish, Portuguese, Khmer, um, and if you call and you don't, you need additional languages, we have a language line that accesses about 200 languages and dialect. Our 201 is a member of 246 201 call centers across the country, and um, we have three staff who are certified specialists um, information referral services and four who are particularly specialized in information referral for older adults. We have a statewide database which has 6,000 local agencies and 11,000 resources. Next slide. Part of the work that we do, we're one of the only two on ones in the country that not only can you call us, not only can you come to our office when before COVID. Um, uh, now that we're, we're, our office is not closed, but before COVID, you can come to us in our office and you can call us, you can text us, and you can see us at about 50 events a month um, across the state via our RV. So there you have an image of our RV and you'll see us at state events, parks, um, festivals. Next slide. The list, I'm not gonna go through the list, is the list of all the people we partner with across the state. Um, next slide. Is a list 
of all the partners we partner with at the United Way 201 between um, addiction, um, human, human, human health, health and human services, gamblers line, um, disaster line. We kind of took the disaster response to another level in the midst of COVID. Um, we responded to the Department of Health. Uh, I was, like, I think the day before the first COVID case was announced, our 201 call center was activated to respond to crisis calls. Our numbers have nearly doubled to about 10,000 calls a month um, at our peak. Average call volume is about 5,000 calls a month. Um, but during COVID, you know, our peak call volume has been about 10,000 calls. And we take calls uh, from any, any, uh, particularly for COVID, anyone who asks for information about uh, testing sites, housing information, um, EPBT, food, utilities, you name it. Next slide is a list of integrated uh, resources that also are connected with our 2 in one regarding Medicaid and referral, Medicaid and Medicare enrollments, benefits enrollments, um, SNAP benefit supports, state health insurance um, enrollments, senior Medicare patrol, and a cybercrime helpline help hotline. Last about two years ago, um, we partnered um, with the national organization to provide resources and referrals for cybercrime. Um, and we work, we work, work in close partnership with the state police and the FBI. And if somebody is a victim of cybercrime, you can call 211 and we will triage um, the information and um, connect you with state police and also provide information referral services for other, if, for other needs that you may have in your home as a result of the, um, cyber, the, the cyber crime. We also have an after hours crisis line uh, where we take calls uh, for the Office of Healthy Aging um, any, anywhere from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday, holidays and weekends. We have a navigator program Life science, life span respite uh, grant where we work with um, care providers and provide um, support services, uh, support information as well too. Um, Alzheimer's. Next slide. I'm hoping I'm keeping up with you all. Services provided by Two and One should be the slide. We also provide earned income tax credit information, referrals to food banks. Um, housing applications, special needs registry, and we also work in close partnership with the state to do warm transfers to behavioral health, substance abuse, gambling, addiction services. Next slide. One of our closest partnerships is with the Office of Healthy Aging, and we started our partnership with them in 2010, and we have benefit specialists um, who help older adults. Into, with enrollment into Medicare and Medicaid. We provide options counseling, wraparound services. We have about 40,000 contacts a year as a result of this work. And the final slide is um, what, what time our point um, relationship, hours of operation, how many full-time employees we have, multilingual staff. Again, we, we have well, access to about 200 languages and dialects, and um, we also have walk-in services. I believe that's it, and, and, and I adhere to the, I think, the five minutes I was allowed. Thank you. Just before, um, Commissioner Perry has also, uh, Perry has uh, um, joined us also, by the way. Sorry. So would you like, would um, any, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Black, Ms. Nkomo, Ms. Um, Gibble, do you want to say some final comments and then we can go into questions and answers? Mr. Black, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Gibble? Ms. Honestly, I, I would love to, to dive into questions, but you know, right. I, I'd like to, to hear what you know Daniel and Rebecca have to say on that before committing us to that. Right. It won't be a final comment, but I meant, you know, do you want to say anything else before I can get to the Q and A? That's all. All right. All right. So, um, uh, committee members, councilman, oh, uh, oh, we have first we have um, deputy majority leader Harris, and then uh, vice chair Ryan and president Matos. Um, deputy majority Harris, you have the mic. Thank you, sir, and thank you for knowing how to look at those hands. I'm just not catching on to them. 
And I'm very slow about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the guests tonight for coming out tonight and giving us a presentation, such a great presentation. And I'm so glad to hear that in those cities, that is an innovative project that is working. I think my first question would be, how connected to these diversion programs are you? Because my biggest thing that I seem to have a struggle with is that we don't have the diversion programs that we should have. I'm gonna use an example. When I got in office, I started working with our local police uh, lieutenants or whatever. They actually was not taking people to jail for open containers or whatever, because we had a, um, um, uh, uh, a social service that had the Providence Center with the mental health people that were there to able to take it for another level. Uh, that funding got cut. So the police was not able to use any other tool. Like, you know, I, I felt like that was great to put them in the car. Uh, I always thought of it as an Uber driver and drive them to where they can get the most help. Because um, you're right with the, with the social struggles right now that we see, a lot of it is about people and their social health and how they self-medicate sometimes and not be on the proper medication. Connected to all the things that you heard, um, um, our um, Angie, um, I'm gonna mess up your last name because I'm, my, my Southern accent, um, talked about in the 211 and the 221 calls. It's a lot of that has a lot to do with people just struggling. So my question is, how much do you rely on the diversion program? Uh, the second question is that um, you you spoke of this as being uh, something that was located inside of, the, of the, the headquarters of the police department, or is that a separate building? Did I miss something? I mean, I know we're talking about two different things. We're talking about um, STAR, and then we're talking about COOP. So um, please, if you can, if you understood my question, please help me with that. Sure. Uh, so I can speak to, you know, cahoots and the relationship that we have with, uh, you know, various resources. The, the success of the cahoots program is primarily the result of our collaboration with all manner of other resources that we can divert folks to rather than taking them to the hospital or rather than, you know, a situation escalating to the point where they end up in jail. Uh, so, uh, you know, to that extent, I, I try to remind folks that CAHOOTS doesn't operate in a vacuum, right? We need to have places to take people in order for us to be able to keep them out of those traditional systems. At the same time, just showing up and having a different kind of first responder is a significant step in addressing social determinants of health that can inform things like substance use and abuse as, as a, a way to medicate and respond to trauma that has been going on in some case, cases for generations. Uh, so simply having another kind of first responder who is not obligated to uh, enforcement, um, you know, who's not obligated to you know, generate income through, through tickets, um, is, is going to have some beneficial impacts on a community. Um, you know, even just that experience of, of reaching out for help, you know, right now, if, if you're in such dire straits that, um, that you need somebody that can get you to the hospital, you know, we're really asking communities to call the police on themselves. And that, and that's one of the shortcomings of the CAHOOTS program that we're trying to address is getting a number that's not affiliated with the police department as our main point of contact. That's, that's something that we were late to catch on to, and we are trying to make up for lost time now. Um, we are, we are very directly connected to the police department, but we are not housed under the same umbrella. You know, we are one program of a nonprofit. Whitebird Clinic is a federally qualified health center that has programming that, that runs the full spectrum for, you know, behavioral health, medical, dental, and case management services. So CAHOOTS is just one, one little pocket within that. You know, we receive that funding and we do get dispatched over the police radio, but our headquarters is, you know, as, as a, a nondescript little office building in, in downtown Eugene. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is very much an arm's distance relationship from law enforcement and, uh, you know, a very intimate uh, hug with those resources that we need, as you mentioned, to, to be able to divert folks from, you know, traditional means of enforcement. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I? Yeah. 
Madam? Uh, yes, I'd like to follow up because uh, you do depend a lot on those diversion programs to have uh, uh, be able to be able to do your work effectively, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Have we done a poll of what that is here in Providence? I mean, for me, that's very important that we talk about that. I began my term with an organization that was pushing the city to start to look at that. But, you know, sometimes we're a little slow about thinking about things. You know, we come a little later. I mean, you can't put the cot before the horse. Hey, I'm from the South, so I use all these terms, forgive me. Um, put the cot before the horse, you know? And I feel like a lot of times we do those kind of things. And I see I see sometimes when I see um, things getting diluted, something that could be really great can get diluted if it's not connected to the proper piece. Do we need those diversion programs to be able to be successful with groups are we could we be successful without the diversion programs that's going to be a question that your community is going to have to answer uh, for itself and and some of that you know as you mentioned is going to take the form of a poll to really look at what's out there um but you know it's hard for me as somebody from oregon to come in and say this is what providence needs because i'm not a resident of providence you know um it, it's really going to be your community that informs what a version of cahoots would look like um, you know, as, as Ms. Gibble mentioned, the STAR program in Denver looks different in many ways from CAHOOTS in Eugene and Springfield because that program was designed to meet the needs of Denver. What happens in Eugene and Springfield with CAHOOTS is designed to meet the needs of that community. And we would expect and, and hope that, you know, Providence really finds a way to learn from, from CAHOOTS, learn from the STAR program in Denver, and implement something that is going to be new, nuanced and unique to your community's needs. Thank you. A second thing is um, we have uh, given the power to our um, firemen to um, distribute the drug. Uh, I'm going to mess it up. I think it's like a Novocaine or something like that for people who are ODN, I don't I don't know exactly what they call it, but they that's ODN. I was there in the city council uh, in the hall of the Almond Chambers when that power was given to our um, um, firemen to do that. Do you distribute that drug when you go on your mm -hmm. um, I, outreach yeah. to people? Yeah, I personally have administered Narcan six times for opioid Narcan. overdose. Narcan, there you go. Um, and, you know, it's something that we, we don't have the resources to hand out to, you know, consumers and patients. Uh, we are able to connect them to resources with other harm reduction organizations in our community that can provide them with that Narcan and the training that goes along with it. As a member of my community, personally, I do carry Narcan with me. Um, that's informed by my experiences as a first responder. And it's certainly something that would need to be a component of any mobile crisis programming in any community. Thank you so much. I'm gonna listen at the rest of the questions. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Mr. Um, Next up we Vice Chair Ryan, but before that, let the record reflect that Fire Chief Zach Kenyon is on the line also. Vice Chair, you have the, you have the mic. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, I would like to thank also the pre presenters tonight on, for um, making yourself available for this discussion. It's very important to the, the, for the council body. Um, we did have a re resolution come before us and I'm excited that we're having these conversations. Um, I, I'm very ex um, uh, impressed with your enthusiasm. Um, you, all, you have different programs, but you all share the same enthusiasm um, towards uh, a social service response. And I, I think that's great. I had a, a couple of questions on relative to staffing on, and I guess I'd like to start with cahoots first, if someone could provide an answer for how many staffers, in, when you started up the operation, how many people were actually on staff um, at startup? How did you train them? What type of training do they have? Um, and what did ongoing training look like as the program developed? So could you speak a little bit about that? Um, sure. So our, you. you know, when our program started off, uh, we were only operating 40 hours a week. Um, so I think we had a grand total of two and a quarter FTE between you know field responses and a little bit of office time. Uh, that, that, that FTE was held by six folks. 
Um, so at the very start of our program, everybody that worked on Cahoots was very part-time, um, working elsewhere in the clinic uh, for, for Whitebird. So they're, they're bringing with them a lot of experience in, in crisis intervention and de-escalation. Um, so, you know, our, our training process when we first started was more of um, an adaptation of skills that folks had already demonstrated in other areas of service. You know, now 31 years later, we have roughly, oh gosh, I'm gonna ballpark just shy of 30 FTE that goes into our program. And that FTE is held by about 40, 45 folks. Uh, the training process now looks very different than what it did at its inception. And that's because we've tried to formalize a lot of things and, and really make sure that when we're sending folks out as part of those two-person response teams that we're really sending them out prepared to, to run in any different scenario that they could encounter. And so our training process now looks like a combination of about 500 hours of field training that happens over a three to six month period. And that's coupled with roughly 30 to 40 hours of classroom time where we are going over things like mental health assessments, you know, neurobiology of addiction, uh, but also really spending usually about 10 hours in de-escalation and compassionate communication. Um, you know, how to interact with folks who are escalated in an acute crisis in ways that are safe uh, and, and that, you know, maintain safety for the patient as well as the first responders. We will also proctor skills labs for individual, uh, you know, training needs within a specific cohort. And that's kind of the final thing is that we now do train in cohorts. So there's an opportunity to have a peer base that you're learning from and, and working alongside in these classroom settings and then going out as part of that. Um, you know, two person team and, and supporting them as a third person really incrementally applying the skills that you've learned in the classroom setting. So, you know, what we're doing now is, is, is much more in line with the types of training and, and the, the level of training that you would see from other public safety entities. But, you know, it's certainly been a long road for us to get there now. And what about staff loss or fallout? How, you know, do you lose a lot of staff members along the way or are they uh, pretty consistent and uh, stable? We, we generally, uh, folks that, that make, you know, make it through our training process tend to stick with our program for quite a while. Uh, myself, I'm part of a cohort of six that were hired in 2010. Four of us still work for the program now. Um, and we are not the most senior members of our team. We have several staff that have been with the program for a dozen years, 15, almost 20 years in a couple of cases. Um, so there, there, there seems to be you know, significant, really profound ability for us to retain staff. Some of that is because of the flexibility in our schedule. So, you know, you might further your career by going to PA school or, uh, you know, going and getting your RN or going to grad school and getting a master's in social work, but you can still hang on to those evening and weekend shifts with the CAHOOTS program. And so what we see is people will, will grow through their careers. And as they're gaining new skills, gaining new credentials, they're then bringing it back to the CAHOOTS program. And so we have folks that started off as an EMT basic, got their paramedic and are now RN in the emergency room who help us with all of the training for medic staff that we bring in. You know, we have folks that, that started off with us while they were still in undergrad who are now graduating with their master's in social work and they're supporting us with clinical supervision and, and training in the mental health assessment tools that we use out in the field. So, um, you know, that and some other components of, of really just kind of working for Wiper Clinic as an agency create a culture where we generally do, you know, retain staff for quite a while. Great. You had mentioned that uh, so the uh, CAHOOTS program is fully in, integrated into the um, public safety uh, mm -hmm. model. Um, and you also talked about engaging um, with the police um, in training. And, mm -hmm. and um, could you talk about what that looks like? Or, you know, was I, what did it first look like? And what does it look like now? Yeah. Just working together in a collaborative fashion to build your program and Certainly. understand the services and, and you know, build a, a, a collaborative program. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little about that? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, Wiper Clinic has, is, is a grassroots organization. You know, we, um, you know, really our, our founders identified most with, you know, the counterculture movement. And so, um, there was some apprehension from public safety to all of a sudden have a bunch of hippies on the police radio, uh, you know, and, and there was some concern that as soon as those said hippies were on their police radios, we were going to be tattling on everybody all of the time. Uh, and, and what quickly became evident was that there was this new group of compassionate people who wanted to be doing first response work and recognize that they had a role to fill. 
right? And and so over over you know probably the first five ten years of the program, we went from being you know the the odd kid out on the playground to really you know being perceived as brothers and sisters in in first response in in the public safety world, and and with that came more opportunity for us to be part of you know more acute responses because as as we demonstrated our value and our ability to handle all all manner of behavioral health crises we started to see opportunities where maybe this was a more acute situation where there was going to be some sort of negotiation team from the police department, but then they were asking cahoots to come and stage to provide behavioral health support so that things could be deescalated, not with an eye towards let's get this person in cuffs and yarded off to the hospital involuntarily, but hey, something wasn't working for this person, things escalated, and we can get this back into a calm place where they can have a voluntary interaction with a behavioral health provider rather than trying to talk about what's been going on, you know, to somebody who's got a badge and a gun. Um, so, so what we've what we've done is really shown that there's a place for our type of response in the public safety landscape. And we've been able to role model with officers, you know, this is how we can approach these escalated situations. This is how we can talk about somebody experiencing the symptoms of mental illness rather than labeling that person as a schizophrenic. You know, we can say this person is experiencing schizophrenia, right? So what we've seen is the sea change in the public safety entities that we work with in how they perceive, how they discuss, and how they approach behavioral health crises, drug, you know, drug addiction issues, um, and, you know, even, you know, some more, more basic social service things like folks who are unable to make basic, meet basic human needs. Um, so, you know, now um, we see Kahoot staff presenting mental health first aid alongside officers who have gone through the training to provide the curriculum to, you know, to their, their coworkers in, in public safety. Um, you know, we have a role in the crisis intervention team training where we sit down specifically to talk about de-escalation and we will watch videos of interactions that officers have had that have not gone well with a group of new recruits after going through the white bird and cahoots de-escalation to talk about now that you know how cahoots approaches de-escalation where in this video that we're watching could this arrest have gone a different way or where in this interaction could things have been prevented from resulting in an arrest or a violent encounter how frequently does that uh, take place, that role playing? Is that like a weekly? Is it a monthly? How right does now that happen? An, yeah, right now it's an annual thing. Uh, and, and we would like to make it become something that happens with a lot more frequency. We would also okay. like to include many more consumer voices in, in that, you know, right now, you know, Cahoots has a seat at the table and we need to use that privilege to amplify other voices because we think that there is still a lack of consumer, you know, perspective in, in many of the initiatives that we're trying to work on locally. If there is a problem with um, a police uh, response, mm -hmm. um, when you call for backup, if you will, using the term that you used, mm -hmm. uh, what do you do? Uh, well, I text the chief and say, hey, we've got a problem. When can we talk about it? Um, but I also follow that up with an email to our, our you know, specified, identified you know, liaison for, for that law enforcement agency. Uh, we have regular business meetings where we're making sure that we're upholding, you know, the contract on both sides. Uh, you know, we're talking about things like those performance issues, personnel matters that are coming up. Uh, it's also a place where we can talk about, hey, we noticed that on that really busy night we had last week, dispatch was really trying to prioritize our calls geographically. And we really appreciated that they didn't ping pong us back and forth across town. And um, so, you know, there are these regular routine avenues for communication and feedback to be provided. And I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time, Mr. Chair. Am I okay to continue to uh, ask these questions? Yeah, um, yes, I'm just, just asking to be, be aware I'm, of the I'm time. I'm gonna try, I'm, I'm sensitive. I'm sensitive to the time, but um, I'm very intrigued. You mentioned a contract for safety mm -hmm. um, in your presentation. Could you talk what, to, uh, to us about what that is about? Sure, and I'll, you know, I'll attempt to be, to be brief. Essentially, contract for safety is, is when we are able to utilize you know, uh, resources and tools within somebody's immediate environment uh, to, to empower that individual to keep themselves and or others safe for a period of time. Um, those typically, we're looking for a safety contract in situations where CAHOOTS was called out related to suicidal ideation, self-harm, uh, you know, those types of, of, of situations. And so what we're looking at is, can we get to a place where without taking you to another location, without bringing in additional resources, can we, can we find a way using you know, existing tools, existing coping skills for you to keep yourself and others safe for a defined period of time? 
Sometimes that is for the next three hours and then you're going to call us back. Sometimes that's overnight until you can make it to that, that drop in appointment that, that you were able to get last minute, you know, with your provider the next business day. Um, so it's, you know, that, that becomes a really kind of gray area, but ultimately that contract for safety is about maintaining personal, you know, maintaining personal safety in the wake of some sort of, you know, acute behavioral health crisis. And then um, just a quick question on, on your, your funding, your primary funding source comes from where? comes from the city budget. So we are, we are uh, in, included as part of public safety funds. Our, our funding Even when is, you started out, I yeah. um, didn't mean to interrupt, even when yeah, you started even, out. Even f and when we started out, the city just gave us a little bit of money to see if this thing would work. And are you members of the union? We are not members of the union. Uh, we are, you know, employees of a, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, this particular nonprofit is a collectively organized agency, uh, which means that, you know, we essentially serve as our own union in, in many different ways. So when it comes time to really address things like benefits or uh, wages, we engage in a collective process just because that's how we, we address all of our, our business as an organization. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your uh, responses. Thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, next, we have President Matos then Councilman LaFortune and Councilman Taylor. President Matos? Um, she, I, Mr. Mr. Clerk, the President, do you need to, she needs to mute herself? Oh, she's unmuted. Oh. President Matos, you have the mic. Can you hear us? Uh, she's connecting her audio. Okay. Come you want to call? You want us to come back? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, then we're going to uh, Councilman La Fortune. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, you have the mic, Councilman. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I want to thank um, Becky, Daniel, Angie, and Tim. Um, for the wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I especially, because they're local, Tim, so we appreciate you too, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to, I, I appreciate, I, I completely appreciate everything that um, Becky and Daniel and Angie um, have been doing and also the time that they have spent in really looking at um, the various models and also sharing some of the work like Angie did that their organizations have been doing. And I'm very grateful for the time that we've spent. Um, we've actually been meeting weekly um, um, to discuss various models. So it's, it's just been a very enlightening um, engagement and really thinking about um, um, just what other cities are doing. So I have two parts. So one is a comment and um, the second part is a question. Um, I wanted to just bring up that um, Eugene, um, Oregon, and Providence, um, Rhode Island, although um, in population size it's comparable, the demographics are quite different. In Eugene, um, over about 78% of the population is white and everyone else is people of color. Um, and I also want to go back to a really great question that Deputy Majority, um, um, Deputy Majority Harris posed, um, and 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 talking about like um, you know statistical data, and um, Tim mentioned um, social determinants of health, um, and one thing I want to remind everyone is that social determinants of health hinder outcomes, and the reporting has been displayed in um, the recent um, and in past. Um, Kids Counts facts books and also um, housing works um, reported um, reports um, in um, 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 John Friedman, um, Professor John Friedman, his new opportunity atlas, which tracks economic mobility. And in fact, if you put in a zip code um, for an individual, it will tell you what the um, outcome may be, the life um, outcome in earnings um, potential which when you look at it and make a comparison between crime rates or arrest rates in those particular communities, um, you can see how this adverse, um, this negative police interactions and arrests um, and not having strong social service safety nets, how it um, adversely impacts um, communities of color and um, um, low income communities and in general, marginalized communities. 
One thing we also did not talk about is support structures for youth. And one of the components within CAHOOTS is the HOOTS program, which is, um, which with that program is on-site integrated healthcare clinics inside of high schools, which is quite critical, which provides social emotional support services to students. Um, and, 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 and another thing I wanna bring up is many components of what CAHOOTS is doing and um, the, also the initiative STARS initiative in Denver is doing um, is almost a combination of what different organizations such as United Way 211 is doing, such as House of Hope's outreach um, initiative, such as the Institute of Nonviolence um, um, intervention initiatives, such as family services. There's also a 211 um, crisis response program, which also has um, a mobile um, response um, um, component in Connecticut. And so one of the things that I, you know, I think it's really important for us as council to think about is, well, there are various models and perhaps the exact model in these various places might not necessarily work in Providence, um, but we can take components from those models that might be integrated into something that could be quite successful here. Um, and I know that Tim mentioned uh, earlier that, um, you know, the program is integrated into public safety, um, but you, he also mentioned that that's something that they're trying to pull away from because they've come to realize um, that um, you know, a model where um, the organization or the initiative is independent makes the most sense. And as we think about the social climate of our community, as we think about the demographics of our community and the needs of our community, one thing we have to be reminded of is that the community is saying that we want something that's completely independent from the police um, and that is um, created by community members. So just a couple of things to remember. Also in terms of like the cost, with the CAHOOTS program, um, just based on the um, facts that's available online, it looks like it costs about a little under $2 million. But when you look at the savings, it's about a $18 million, um, actually, sorry, $14 million savings on ambulance and emergency rooms, also an $8 million saving on public safety. And you think about the savings, not just the city um, um, has, but also, um, the same savings of the individual, particularly those who are underinsured um, or don't have insurance, and even folks who are insured, you think about the cost that they have to pay out of pocket just to get picked up by an ambulance. So just having that intervention and providing people with specific needs um, that is not emergency or violent related, but really looking at how do we provide acute res uh, acute response, acute crisis response that can meet the mental health concerns of our community. So one thing I would like for um, if Becky can do is um, if, if you can talk a bit more about the Denver program and its collaboration with some of the other um, social service um, programs within the community. So I've, I'm, I'm just dipping my toe into this, but, but as I mentioned earlier, because the program STAR is overseen by a coalition of organizations that already exist within the community, much like White Bird already existed within Eugene, it was able to, they're able to uh, administer services that are more specifically needed in Denver that maybe aren't, I don't know, I don't wanna speak about what's needed in Eugene. Uh, but because these organizations are overseeing it, that's also who's staffing the programs from my understanding. So the, the organizations, like when you're pulling the mental health uh, clinician, the, those clinicians are, you're able to pull from the organizations that are involved. And those organizations include, but are not limited to, Mental Health Care of Denver, Denver Justice Project, Denver Alliance for Street Health Response, and Denver Homeless Out Loud. Um, and right now, again, the paramedic component is coming separately from one of their large health systems, their hospital system, Denver Health. Tim, do you know any, I know that you probably helped to put this program in place. Can you speak to any of those organizations more specifically? Uh, I, I, I Or speak to maybe, yeah. maybe more like what were the different needs in Denver that then were reflected by the differences mm -hmm. in the organization that was set up there? 
to be perfectly honest, the, the approach that Denver has taken is where we have been trying to get to in, in Eugene of having that, that group, uh, you know, oversight outside of, of just one organization. Uh, you know, and as I mentioned, as we look towards building our own dispatch center, you know, our own dispatcher within, you know, kind of public safety, we are trying to, you know, develop a stewardship council so we can achieve a lot of those same ends. Um, when everybody from Denver came out to Oregon last year to meet with us, I was really impressed by the, the diversity of um, areas of focus. Uh, you know, there were there was a, a group working with folks uh, who were transitioning back into, um, you know, the world after being in prison, um, you know, alongside mental health and behavioral health services and homeless outreach. So so really, you know, the group that that is overseeing the star program has found a way to really engage in a program that is culturally responsive. Um, you know, I, I would veer away from saying culturally competent because that is that implies that we, you know, the, a group has understood and can respond to every, you know, can fix everything. And then really, um, you know, even hearing from, you know, you know, members of Servicio de la Raza, one of the groups in Denver, um, you know, responsive is the right term because it's really recognizing sometimes you don't know, you know, the right thing. And so you're, you're kind of working from this place of, of compassion. But um, yeah, what, what, what Denver is doing with the STAR program and as Becky, you know, identified is, is really what looks to us to be the most effective way to heed the voices of the community and make sure that the services that are being provided are dynamic and can be, uh, you know, amended or augmented uh, as, as different needs arise. Thank you. Councilman LaFortune, you have a follow-up question? Sure. Um, I just want to, um, just based on what you everyone just said, um, one of the things that also that um, I just thought about is like one of the major causes of recidivism is um, not having social services and opportunities um, for individuals or um, these um, punitive, um, uh, these um, 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 pro policies um, that unfortunately, if someone is, you know, homeless um, and perhaps they have a, a drug addiction, which is not a crime, is actually um, an illness. Um, which people should get medical care and services to address, but someone may go to jail for that. And I think having those so strong social service um, safety nets and having programs like this are ways to also decrease um, more people not only going into jail, um, but um, returning to jail and creating more pathways to opportunities um, and success. So that's it. Thank you so much, everyone. I truly appreciate all the information that you provided. Thank you, Councilman. President Matos, Madam President. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just have two questions for um, both uh, programs, the CAHOOS programs and also the STAR. Uh, one is, what is the uniform that you guys use? Are you part of the police uniform, uniform, part of the fire uniform, or do you have your own uniform? So the CAHOOTS uniform is jeans and a hoodie. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, some of, you know, some of that is, is that we want to really visually look different than traditional public safety. Um, but there's also just that recognition and you got to meet people where they're at. And that includes, you know, recognition that, that the clothes we wear can, in, can, uh, inform perceptions of privilege and, and status. Uh, and so, you know, uh, most of the time you see a team rolling up. Um, if it's warm weather, it's a t-shirt and long pants, you know, some dirty work boots. Um, but that's, that's really it. Even our vehicles look different. You know, we try to try to stay away from the dark colors of patrol cars or the bright red or, you know, you know, that you might see for other emergency vehicles. And so we drive big white cargo vans that clearly have the Cahoots logo emblazoned on the side. So there's no mistaking us as being something other than those traditional resources. And I, I believe, you know, Becky, I think, isn't Star doing the same thing? Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Work boots, hoodie. Yep. So that they're identifiable, but not, they don't, they don't look like someone that's going to take you away somewhere involuntarily. Thank you. And my second question is, I heard a lot about Mental health, mental health issues and uh, substance abuse. Does any of the programs uh, of, of these programs deal with any other quality of life issues? Um, I can give you an example. One of uh, one of the calls that we regularly get is loud music, right? 
and I'm very hesitant to call the police to go for loud music, but that's the only choice I have right now. And I have constituents that are expecting me to do that. So um, does any of the programs address all the quality of life issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and really that gets back to, you know, the social determinants of health, you know, right? There, there are so many different things beyond having a mental health diagnosis or, or you know, struggling with addiction that can precipitate a crisis emerging and, and, lead, and escalating to the point where police are, are involved. Uh, and, and to that extent, you know, the CAHOOTS program and I believe STAR as well are also trying to engage folks with services that will meet basic needs like shelter, um, you know, like personal hygiene, getting a shower, um, you know, supporting access to resources to enroll in, in public benefits or get just get your birth certificate so you can go and get an ID. Uh, you know, all, all of these other things can inform a crisis. Um, social isolation is a, is a huge reason for, you know, folks in our area going to the emergency room, right? You know, they, they, they don't have other social connections. And so when they feel a little bit sick, well, if they go to the hospital, it's not something that's really an emergency room issue. But darn it, if they're not going to get three hours where they can get a cup of coffee, you know, there's a charge nurse to tell their problems to, and then they get back through triage, and then they get to talk to a tech about everything that's wrong, and the doctor, and then they get to, you know, lounge in that space until they're discharged. And, and so there are all of these other issues that, you know, a, a CAHOOTS or STAR type program can come in and respond to that are, are going to occur before things have escalated the same way they might in other communities. Um, Specific though to, to issues like you mentioned around that noise complaint, um, there is room for there to be something that's not cahoots and not police, you know, that would take the form more of community mediation. And, you know, and I, I would encourage you all in Providence to really consider that community me mediation and other restorative justice initiatives alongside, you know, mobile crisis to really look at, you know, the full spectrum of police involvement and, and all of the different areas outside of behavioral crises where other resources could be employed with, you know, significant return on investment or, you know, be, uh, be accomplished without involving public safety in any, any fashion. Um, I would, in, in just kind of jumping off of what Tim is saying in reflection of STAR, one of, the, one of the, one of the, yes, hello. Uh, yeah. Oop, am I working? Am I on? Yeah. Can you hear me now? I, Good. I, I, just, just one second, just so everyone understands, the reason why I recognize you is because it's, it's an official record. So ah, yes. Unless you say Ms. Gibble, they just hear a voice, they don't know who it is. So for the, this is actually a full-blown, legitimate public uh, city council finance meeting, so we have to maintain a record for the clerk. So that's why I had to announce your name. Right? So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that explanation. That's great. So to, to piggyback on what Tim was speaking of in terms of uh, one of the reasons that I'm so excited by the CAHOOTS model also speaks to what Nirva and uh, Deputy Majority Leader Harris were talking about, which is this need for connective tissue, connecting the populations in need with the services that are that are currently available in the Providence area, but but maybe people don't have access to. So one of the things that STAR talks about is connecting people to a spot called The Gathering Place, which uh, provides a uh, drop-in center providing meals, job readiness programs, services for women, children, uh, and transgender issues, uh, transgender folks fe facing issues, uh, also issues surrounding poverty. So it's, it's like this, this service can be connective tissue that links people to long-term solutions and long-term help that is, that is diverse and helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm all set for now, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, uh, Chief Councilman Taylor. Okay, a um, couple questions. Uh, Tim or Dan, I think you mentioned, but I missed it. How many people, so you're in the white van, you have two people per van. How many vans do you have working in Eugene, Oregon a day? Sure. Uh, we have at least two vans on 24 hours a day uh, in, in Eugene, which is the smaller, or excuse me, the, the larger component of our metro area. We have a second van that comes on for responses just in Eugene, 12 hours a day. So, you know, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., we got three vans taking calls, 10 p.m. to 10 a.m. We got two vans on the road. Uh, we do augment, augment that twice a week with a street outreach team, but they're not receiving dispatch calls. Okay, I know you said some of them were, uh, uh, they're probably maybe paramedic out there, but the EMT trained mm -hmm. that are on the um, 
the vehicles? Yeah, we whenever we have our, our response team, that's going to be staffed by two folks. One start working as a, a crisis worker, the other one working as a medic. About a third of our team holds dual discipline training where they are both certified as at least an AMT basic in Oregon, but have also been trained as a crisis worker for the CAHOOTS program. Um, and you said they don't have Narcan? You don't, you, you can't, I mean, you should be able to administer Narcan. We, we administer Narcan, but we do not give it out as an outreach tool. You know, so we've got Narcan, you know, with us. We're going to use it during an intervention if, if there is an opiate overdose, but we don't have a dozen spare Narcan kits to hand out to folks on the street as part of any outreach initiative. But if you get called, say, for a person unconscious in the street and it's a known heroin addict or something, you pull up, you can you, 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 um, give the Narcan that you have, you have it. And Absolutely. then just get and get reimbursed either by the police or the fire, correct? Yeah, um, you know, and we, we, we don't worry about a reimbursement. That's just kind of built into our... Not reimbursement, but a replacement. Uh, replacement. Sure, replacement. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, honestly, um, you know, CAHOOTS does not uh, dispatch to opiate overdoses because we're not an emergency service. We don't run lights and sirens to calls. But, you know, as I mentioned, I've, I've administered Narcan personally half a dozen times. Every single one of those calls started off as something different, either... I need a ride to detox or uh, my friend wants to talk to you about their, their drug use. Uh, so, you know, so there are, there are very frequently situations that presented something different, but you know, over the course of the intervention, you know, we're going to end up utilizing Narcan. Now, Eugene, Oregon, police and fire, are they combination dispatch or separate? They are, there's a separate dispatch console uh, for police and for fire, but they are in the same building the, the call takers and dispatchers for both of those are trained so that they can rotate between police and CAHOOTS dispatch and then fire and EMS dispatch. Okay, because here in Providence, we have police. They're in the same building, but they're separate. In other words, police does. So let me get run this down. I want you to run this by me and see how you would do it. So you hear over the scanner, which you're going to hear police on fire because they call for a, a suicidal male mm -hmm. at X, Y, and Z, you know, a 20-year-old suicide male at X, Y, and Z. It goes to both police and fire. They both respond. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you would hear it and run through how you would do that, like on a run if you hear it on the scanner. Sure. Um, so, if if we hear, so that that's that's assuming that Cahoots hasn't been dispatched as the primary responder. Um, mm -hmm. You know, by and large, in our community, when there's a report of somebody experiencing suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. there is always going to be an objective to try and and ensure that Cahoots can be the first response for that person. Uh, the only situations where we're not going to be the sole first responder are if there is a weapon that cannot be secured on scene or if somebody has already engaged in, in activities that um, necessitate an emergency you know, EMS response. Um, so that's they've already taken that bottle of pills or they've, they've already engaged in other um, you know, self-harm measures to the extent that there's, there's a risk of fatality. Um, so, so let's do a suicidal male. With a, sure. with a weapon, with a weapon. So su suicidal male with a weapon. What's likely going to happen in that situation is that, um, you know, patrol is going to be sent to, to deescalate the scene with an objective of, of removing the weapon from, from the interaction. Meanwhile, the CAHOOTS team is going to stage out of line of sight, probably about a half mile down the road from, from that situation. And we're listening to everything that's going on over the radio related to that call. And what we're waiting to hear is for the patrol officers who arrived on scene to say, scene is code four for CAHOOTS. That means everything is, is calm and, and the gun is secured. And then CAHOOTS comes in to talk with that person. There is no foregone outcome where this person is going to the hospital regardless of what CAHOOTS does. Simply officers have secured the scene, ensured that it's safe for civilian first responders to come in and take over. Depending on the specifics of that call, the officers are at least going to hang out in their patrol cars, if not leave the scene, once it has been de-escalated and handed over to CAHOOTS. CAHOOTS then is going to enter into that interaction under the auspices of least intervention necessary. We are not going to inflict help on somebody or, you know, initiate a hold on somebody just because things started off that escalated. We still have an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to engage in a contract for safety without that person going to the hospital, without that person going to jail. And so after we've been able to de-escalate a scene with the assistance of patrol at times, we are looking for routes that we can pursue that are going to empower that individual to, you know, build a better toolbox, you know, have a better foundation so that the next time there's that crisis, maybe they don't go to the gun safe to get the revolver out. You know, maybe they call us first. Uh, and, and, you know, and then if we do need to get somebody to the hospital, then, then we're able to facilitate that transport 
on our own in a, in a way that is voluntary for the individual and isn't going to result in that ambulance bill that they would otherwise incur. And also when, okay, so that's the police side. Where would you, um, also I got to mention on the ambulance part, mm-hmm. and I understand that because the city, I'm retired fireman. So sure. if the city makes money on these ambulance calls. Mm-hmm. So I understand we might save money on on the on one side but we might lose money on the other side if we're not transporting and i'm not saying we need to unnecessarily transport people but Mm -hmm. we would lose money on that transport if we for medicine or whatever it was but on the fire side how would you work on the fire side what would you respond to on on the fire side sure one of the things that we respond to quite frequently on the fire side are, are things like lift assists uh, where you know there, there's there's not a reason to, to send six paramedics and turnouts at four in the morning, you know when somebody mm-hmm. needs help getting off the toilet, you know that that's a call that cahoots can respond to. Uh, How about and, like a ETOH or? Mm-hmm. So you know acute intox for you know alcohol or any any number of other substances. Our public safety dispatch is going to try to send cahoots as that first response. So that means you know calling in that person who's who's got an unsteady gait, um, you know had a strong alcohol odor when they were in in the convenience store. Uh, you know, and now is it looks like they're having a hard time staying on the sidewalk. Uh, Cahoots is going to go and talk with that individual, and you know, we're going to say at very least, look, man, you you got to find a place to hunker down. Um, but if you're so intoxicated that you can't adequately care for yourself, uh, then then Cahoots can actually get somebody lodged and sobering, which is run separate from the jail system in our community. Um, so we we have this access to sobering and detox services for those real acute intox situations. And that means that you're not worrying about sending the ambulance out to get somebody cleared medically at the hospital before they can go into detox because now, do you, so you don't you medic. don't you don't transport to um, like detox like you know, Oh absolutely. Would, yeah. So you, know, you would, we, you would yeah, take we, that patient if he's just drunk and you know him all the time. It's Jim Taylor, he drinks all the time. You yeah. pick him up. And you just drive them to the hospital and drop them off a detox. Yeah, you know, yeah, we're going to be saying, like, hey, Jim, you know, <laughs> uh, how's it going? You know, same things as last night. Yeah, man, sorry. All right, well, you know, how bad is it tonight? You know, and, and we'll, do, we'll, we'll do an eval. And if, if they're stable enough that they don't get, no, need to go to the hospital first, then we're just going to take them straight to our, our, our sobering and detox center, which is separate from the, the emergency room system. Uh, you know, we also go out and, and talk with folks who maybe they don't want to go anywhere, but we can – have harm reduction conversations with them around maybe what it, what would it take for them to use less or if they are going to continue to use at this level are there ways that they can you know meet meet that physiological neurochemical need uh, in ways that are less you know impactful on their physical health so you know instead of shooting up are there other other ways that you could still get that high and that that becomes our way to build that bridge to eventually get to the point where we can talk with you about what treatment options are and then you know maybe ideally you know support you in your recovery process you know years down the road also in eugene oregon do they have school resource officers in the high schools yes yes we have sro you in work- the school system right now um do we you do work, work with, with them, them. We do work with them somewhat, uh, but as you know, uh, Council Member LaFortune mentioned, Wiper Clinic has the, the HOOTS program, helping out our teens in schools. And that's taken the CAHOOTS model of the crisis worker and medic and created walk-in clinics that happen at least weekly in every high school in our, in our service area. And that, that covers three districts. We also complement that, that in-school presence, you know, at least weekly with, as I mentioned earlier, presentations in health classes for eighth and 10th graders. So we're building that literacy around mental health and, you know, really building that awareness early on so that those, those young people are more likely to reach out to the, the White Bird staff that are in the schools for those walk-in clinics. And that transfers into better relationships and improved rapport with young people outside of school hours for CAHOOTS responses. Do you respond along with them if, like, say it's a, a violent male or female in a classroom threatening a teacher with a weapon or, you know what I mean? Do you respond to the schools with them if you yeah. heard that call? We, 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 would, uh, we would be happy to join that response if Watch Command, you know, agreed that, that we were an appropriate resource to send into those, you know, violent situations in a school setting. Okay. Now, when you started on that, because I was reading up on it, I, mm-hmm. and then correct me if I'm wrong, when you started on the program, on the pilot program, you guys were funded 200,000. Is that correct or no? I believe that was the initial funding, you know, and, and again, that that's based on, you know, salaries, and, you know, cost of running a program in 1989. And that was one van, not two, correct? Correct. And then now you're at 2.1 million with three vans or, or two vans? 
We have, yeah, we have three vans in our, we have three vans for response, but we have a fleet of six total vehicles right now. That, that means that, you know, if there's maintenance issues, we can still maintain that full scope of service. Um, and how many, how many uh, full-time employees to run mm -hmm. those three vans? Mm -hmm. We have, oh my gosh, uh, we just, we just did, we just added some services. Um, it's just shy of 30 FTE to accomplish both the administrative side of things, our field service delivery, and then training of new staff. Okay. And when, when, when you first came on, sorry, Chairman, I got a few more here. Um, when you first came on with that police and fire, what's that? Just be mindful. Yeah, no. When you first came on in Eugene, Oregon, um, did you find the police or the fire, um, the ones probably not not receptive the the police were less receptive to us in the start uh but we did experience about 10 15 years ago um you know some some static with with fire and that had to do specifically with philosophical differences around harm reduction and um you know some conversations and uh, some shared meals you know later you know we we are in a much more productive place and um, you know, are, are proud to to really, you know, lift up our relationship with both, you know, fire and, and the police department in our area. And when they have like, say, say they have an active shooter or something, I'm going to the extreme here, mm -hmm. but let's say they have something, a riot or whatever they have, do they include you um, in their, uh, we call it the wash, like, you know what I mean? Like afterwards, like include you in to see what you could have done better what they could have done better, what, you know what I mean? Like to, that's a word I forgot I'm looking for. Like, yeah. We, know. yeah, we, we aren't typically involved in critical incident debrief. Um, no. um, and, and we are, you know, right now looking at ways that we could support, you know, kind of uh, response for mass casualty incidents. Uh, one really good example though, of where we come in as, as a kind of a second wave of, of first responders is uh, several years ago, there was a, a, a pedestrian that was, that was struck and, and killed by a train. Uh, this happened at 5.30 on a Thursday night, you know, lots of people walking home, riding their bikes, driving. So there were a lot of witnesses to this, you know, this very public incident. And, and the two CAHOOT teams that were on duty at the time were both brought into that scene to provide crisis counseling to witnesses so that we could break that trauma cycle, you know, before folks had even had a chance to go home and, and you know, really kind of get out of that shock. And, and what that means is that we're able to really go in and, and start to, you know, assist folks in really kind of rewiring those neurons that started to fire because of that traumatic incident and, and ideally prevent, you know, that individual from experiencing, you know, trauma after the event. Uh, that also becomes our way to really kind of engage with folks so that when they are reliving that trauma later on, they can reach out to us. So um, there have been ways that, you know, public safety has, in, has plugged cahoots in in those larger scale responses. And we are still looking for ways to, to be even more engaged with those. And I would argue that um, really being elevated as our own standalone entity in public safety is going to help us accomplish that. And last question, the pilot program, how long did it take to um, get going? And mm -hmm. how long did you stay a pilot program before you actually became not a pilot program? Sure. I believe our initial pilot phase when the program started in 89 was two years. Um, what we have seen more recently with the expansion of services into our, our community of Springfield about six years ago was, uh, you know, that, that was a program that was started with, with state money and they considered the first five years of funding to be the pilot program. So I would argue that, you know, with, with that experience, we should really be looking at a five-year pilot phase because it is going to take a year or two for public safety to get used to this resource, for the community to start to rely on it before you're really seeing, you know, the, the full potential of the program emerge. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Very good answers. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I'm all set. Thank you, Councilman Chief Taylor. Next, we have actually Fire Chief Canyon on the line. Fire Chief. Hi. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Tim. I have a few questions for you. Uh, please, first, uh, thank you very much for spending the time with us. And please thank Chris Hecht, uh, who's been emailing me with a lot of my questions. So I'll limit myself to just a couple. Uh, with the services that we already run here in the fire department, to try to provide uh, alternate destination for people or alternate resources, we find that one of the biggest problems is after hours or normal hours of operation. Um, and also when facilities are full. 
what do you guys do when you need somebody that needs to either go to long-term counseling or 24 seven counseling service, or even the uh, sobering center, as you said, uh, but that center is either full or closed. What mm-hmm. do you do in that time? That's a very relevant question now with a lot of services augmenting how, how they're, you know, de- delivering their services to begin with. Um, really, when we run into a situation where there is not a resource to meet that need, then it's either what is it going to take for this person to feel supported and at least a little bit stabilized where they are, or how are you going to explain to the emergency room, you know, the patient that we're bringing them because there's nowhere else to go. Um, so, you know, in those situations, we're going to talk with somebody a lot and say, like, look, you know, um, there is not a, a bed left in in the sobering center. Um, you know, you're, and, and that's going to be really an issue for somebody who's unhoused. So then um, what are the other shelter resources? And so at times, CAHOOTS has had to reach out and develop partnerships to create respite campsites within sanctioned camping. Um, so at times, we are placing people on tent pads or in micro shelters for 72 hours because there is just no other resource available. And one of the, prelim- one of the primary factors that precipitated this crisis was a, a shelter um, access issue. Uh, you know, so really it's, you know, we, we, we work with what we have and there, there are some really kind of fallback services in the form of the emergency room that we, we will rely on in those rare circumstances where, where there just isn't anything else available. Um, if things have gotten to the point where all of their services are at max capacity, the ER chances are is expecting that we're going to be bringing people in. And in some cases, maybe it's going to be okay for that person to sit quietly and wait in the corner in the ER lobby for six hours while they're waiting just to get to triage. Um, you know, those, those are definitely not ideal situations, but, um, you know, there is obviously a lot more that we're able to do during kind of traditional business hours. And so you see longer calls occurring during those business hours because we can take somebody to another destination and then facilitate a transfer of care so that an individual is connected to that long-term service. You know, in that example you mentioned of somebody who in the middle of the night does need to get connected with long-term care, we're not going to be able to make any service connections that night. So instead of sitting down, you know, instead of handing that person a list of a dozen phone numbers to call the next day, we're going to sit down with them with that resource guide and identify, here's the one number that you're just going to be persistent with calling tomorrow. This, And then you need to call us back by four o'clock tomorrow so that we can talk with you about whether or not those calls were successful. So, you know, there, there are a lot of times where where the plan moving forward is to just call cahoots back in a few hours because maybe more things will be available then. And that person only has to really kind of sit with the unknown and the uncertainty for five or six hours as opposed to five or six days. Okay, thank you. Um, And then a question where you do have a medic riding along with you and you sometimes transport to facilities. Are you licensed by the Department of Health in Oregon? We are designated as a, a mobile clinic um by the state of oregon and what that means is that we're not providing any sort of medical intervention in transit um so you know we have we have the licensure and the designation to be able to provide medical intervention on the scene um but if somebody needs for instance and that includes oxygen um so we'll use that as an example if somebody's oxygen levels are satting really low and we can't get them up before transport and they're going to need oxygen to keep their levels up at a reasonable level then they need to get to the hospital in an ambulance there, there's, there's something else that's going on that indicates this is beyond the scope of care that our medics are, are able to provide. And do you know, did that exist prior to Cahoots or did, was that kind of created for the model that you guys created? I, I'm, that, that was before my time. I, I would have to go back and, and find that out for you. I'll add that in my email to Chris. Um, sure. And then I think um, the last question I had, a uh, large homeless population that you provide services to, mm-hmm. um, one of the concerns I asked in the first question is obviously inclement weather here, which I'm sure you have too, especially in the winter time, to so yes. worry about people being outside. But also I, I was questioning uh, how many of the people of the 24,000 calls you do annually are repeat clients? Mm-hmm. Um, and how often are you able to actually break the cycle where they become repeat clients or you're able to actually provide extra services for them? Um, you know, a lot of times we'll follow a housing first model um, here, where we're trying to provide the housing first and then follow up with the medical and the mental health help that can be provided once the person's a little more stable. So how often do you have repeat customers in your population? Yeah, about a third of our call volume annually is, is repeat callers. And, and those, you know, we call that a duplicate contact. And that's, that's, more, than, uh, that's more than one interaction in, in a 12-month period. So it could be that, that that duplicate contact is only calling us twice a year. You know, it's um, so... 
our crisis work is has not been informed by outcome uh you know on on that level because there are so often situations where it's going to take us years, right, for us to get to the point where somebody doesn't need to call cahoots anymore. Uh, and so we don't measure success by how often or how infrequently, you know, somebody is being called out for a cahoots response. It's, it's really, you know, what is going on over the course of those interventions? Are, 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 are they remaining therapeutic? And, you know, are, are they remaining appropriate? So there are times where we do have to tell somebody, you know, it really looks like the only thing we're, we're accomplishing by, you know, coming out here is you get the opportunity to flirt with a couple of first responders. And so, you know, we're, we're, we are going to impose some limits on, on what our responses look like for you in those situations. Um, you know, when it comes to things like inclement weather response, there are cold weather shelters, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are enough beds for everybody. And so we do frequently have to look to resources like uh, there was a group in Detroit that was making sleeping bags that zipped up and turned into a jumpsuit. So what are the things that we can do using donations and, you know, private foundation money uh, to, to support folks in, you know, surviving the elements when there aren't adequate resources? All right. Uh, I'll limit myself to that, Mr. Chair. Tim, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank Chris for me. I'll email him a lot more questions. I know he's on vacation, um, yeah. but I have a lot more to ask, but I want to be mindful of time. So thank you and keep up the good work. Yeah, I'll give Chris a heads up. All right, thank you. Thanks. Jim. Next, uh, Councilman Miller. Councilman Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had my hand up and then took it down just because uh, some of my questions have been answered. I will just briefly thank everyone uh, for joining this call and also say it really feels like we have an opportunity not just to model a program off of these but to like build on these lessons learned, uh, weave together a bunch of different programs and services that Providence already has existing and like shepherd that out into a pretty robust response system, including uh, I could really see a place for noise complaints as well as these like core uh, social services. So I just wanna thank everyone for participating tonight. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, next up is Councilman Kerwin. Thanks, Chairman. Um, and thank you, Tim and Angie and Rebecca and Daniel. Um, I guess I just have a few questions about the program in Eugene. Um, I think Councilman LaFortune made a lot of really important points that I kind of uh, want to build off and have a few questions answered because, you know, this whole conversation is a response to a public hearing that we had a few weeks ago. And what the major kind of sentiment that we heard during that public hearing is not that we want police reform, but that the community wants to see a Providence where there isn't any police violence and where there really isn't police. Um, and kind of thinking about a future of abolition. And so for me, uh, I've, I'm excited about having an interventionist strategy that's peaceful and is kind of centered in de-escalation um, and tra trauma-informed intervention. But I guess like the biggest barrier as I'm thinking about the CAHOOTS program is really, you know, this difference that Councilman LaFortune noted. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what the crime looks like in Eugene, but here in Providence and certainly in my neighborhood on Smith Hill, um, something that I deal with a lot is street related uh, violence. And so, you know, like it's great if we have a, you know, this non emergency line that's related to the police that, uh, you know, an interventionist can respond to. But for me, I'm thinking about situations where it's not an emergency line, um, where it still would be really valuable to have someone that's not a police officer come. Um, and I know that's kind of difficult for a lot of people to think about because, you know, when we think about like gang violence or when we think about domestic violence, um, there, I think there's this notion that like whoever shows up needs to have a gun and needs to be a police officer. And so I'm wondering like, what happens? Like, are, are there situations in Eugene where, um, you know, like 
a violent incident would occur and there would be someone that showed up or like how do we discern from the person who's calling who doesn't necessarily need someone that's an armed officer to show up how do they discern whether something is violent or non-violent and make that call themselves to call the non-emergency line sure yeah i mean perception plays a huge part in in whether or not things get called in in the first place um and and to that extent, we really rely heavily on on our call takers and dispatchers to translate the requests coming in from the community and make sure that the right resources are being sent. Um, that means that we do have to spend a lot of time in training with with new dispatchers, and also going back to dispatch supervisors with feedback when things have gone well and when things haven't. Um, and we also have to engage, as I mentioned earlier, in a lot of public education. You know, we spend a lot of time meeting with community groups, doing trainings, uh, interviewing in local media to really talk about what are the, you know, the things that CAHOOTS should be responding to. What can you do uh, without calling CAHOOTS to support somebody that was, that's in crisis? You know, really just kind of, yeah, just, just getting out there <laughs> um, and doing a lot of that outreach has, has, has really helped us. But it's, it's really going to, you know, as I say, you know, rely on, on the dispatchers to really make sure that if this program is implemented within the scope of public safety dispatch, it's going to be that 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 point of access that's going to really need a lot of nuance and training uh, in in how they're distributing resources within Providence. Are the dispatch also trained within the public safety or like the police division or, or are they solely trained by CAHOOTS? Um, staff members. Yeah, so we're, we're using the police dispatchers. So, you know, our the, the person who's getting on the radio to tell the, the team that's on duty right now in Eugene about a call that they're going on is the same person who's dispatching you know, <laughs> 10 other police units in the city at the same time. So they're, they're really looking at everything that's not fire that's going on in their community, you know, at, at, while they're on shift. So those dispatchers are, are the same dispatchers that are going through all the de-escalation training that they need to from the police side. They're the ones that are getting the training on how to tell you how to do CPR over the phone. And they're, they're getting training from, you know, cahoots around what is it that cahoots does? How do we offer our services? What does it look like when we're out in the field so that they can then, you know, bring that information into the decision making process about what resources they're sending out for every call that comes through the comm center. Right. Um, I just have an, one more question. Um, so you mentioned like this walkie talkie on the ground style um, communication that happens with mm -hmm. like your interventionists. Um, does you said that this communication is like also the police department also has access to it. So are there situations like um, are police able to without your like consent or without your um, your ask for help or your call for help? Are they able to just show up? And is that something that you see happen ever? There is the yeah, I mean, there is that possibility. You know, we are our calls are held in the same queue as regular, you know, police patrol calls. We are operating on the same priority uh, radio frequencies as patrol. Um, so that means they're hearing everywhere we're going. We're also hearing everywhere they're going. Um, if an officer were to, you know, make the decision to um, self-dispatch to a call that CAHOOTS is going in route to, they're going to have to explain themselves to the CAHOOTS team when they show up, and they're going to have to explain themselves to the watch commander our liaison and the police chief because what they're doing is is they are um, asserting themselves as more of an expert than you know the watch commander on that shift about what resource should be sent to a situation um, so there, there are some pretty significant consequences that are just kind of built into the public safety system for taking a call that wasn't sent to you um, when when those situations do occur and you know they do happen they're very rare um, our, our teams are very good at standing up and, and asserting you know our patients rights to, to not have police in contact for a non-criminal issue um, you know we will hear an officer put themselves en route to our situation we can hop on the radio and in that case say what is it that you're responding here for um, you know and then we can advise over the air so that Everybody who's listening into that, that, you know, patrol traffic at that time is hearing the CAHOOTS team say, we don't need your response right now. You know, it's code four for us. We've got this handled. Uh, and then, you know, that, that individual officer is going to have to answer to an entire police department, um, really an entire public safety division when, if they're choosing to jump calls. So generally we are, we are left alone, you know, when we're on scene with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 
That makes sense. I think, you know, here in Providence, what I am just thinking about is, um, is the reality is, you know, if, if a police, if these two systems are so interconnected, Mm -hmm. um, and an officer is able to intervene and the, it's the role of cahoots to, um, to support someone that's engaging in a non-criminal activity, um, police still have total control over um, over what is criminal. And in Providence, there's like often, in like so many other cities, there's a really fine line, right? Because mm-hmm. like open container drinking is criminal, but right, like a white person drinking in Prospect Park isn't um, isn't going to be enforced the same way that someone. Mm-hmm you know, who's black or brown getting off of work on Broad Street might be in force. Absolutely. So it's just, I'm kind of having a hard time um, thinking about this program logistically about how it would work in the city just because, um, you know, if we're talking about reform and reforming the police department by increasing the technically increasing the public safety budget and Mm. thinking of a new model okay that works but if we're talking about you know actually preventing cops from being on the streets and in and having armed officers on the streets and engaging um uh and potentially engaging in police violence i'm less certain that um that this program is able to curb that um and so that just is my takeaway. But thank you so much for your, uh, your answers. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's exactly why we are really looking to, you know, really um, create more distance from, you know, the police department, especially. Uh, and we have great support from city council, from our mayor and from the police chief to really, you know, have cahoots own its dispatch, you know, within the 911 system, yes, so that we can receive all of those calls that are coming into the 911 center, you know, rather than a direct ask for cahoots, you know, we there, there still is a need for us to be integrated into those with those other systems, so that we can give each other calls at times, you know, but, but we should certainly have more distance than we do right now. And, and we are working towards that in our community. And, and that's something that, you know, we're excited to offer, you know, as we work with other cities, hopefully Providence, you know, as well, um, is really that opportunity to watch us kind of iron out these kinks of taking this program and pulling it out of the police department so that we don't have to start something in another city, you know, and then, and then work through the same growing pains a year or two later. Um, so, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And that's, that's something that we're working to accomplish ourselves here in town. Thank you. Uh, next up is Deputy Majority Leader Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was waiting to hear the question, and I want to pose this question because uh, uh, you didn't speak a lot about uh, the police unions. Can you share a little bit about what that um, may have been? I, I can understand the collaboration between the police chief being a little easier than mm-hmm. dealing with these unions. So. Um, in both of those cities, uh, have you had any opposition from the unions? And if so, can you just share a little bit about what that was? Sure. Yeah, we haven't had any opposition from the Eugene and Springfield, you know, police unions. Um, generally, the perception by local law enforcement, uh, you know, both at the union level and, you know, on the patrol level is that um, aside from the fact that Cahoots is handling a lot of the, the things that folks didn't sign up to be officers for in the first place, there is a strong perception of the Cahoots program as a force multiplier um, because it keeps officers free to respond to emergencies and crimes. Um, what we have seen from police, the police union in Portland, Oregon, is concern for safety, um, that it's not so much an objection to the necessity of the service, but fear that the people this program is intended to serve are too dangerous for civilian response. Uh, and where that fear comes from is, is a whole different conversation. Thank you so much. That was just it, Chairman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deputy Majority Leader. Next, we have Councilman Espinel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, uh, and, uh, members of City Council as well as our guests tonight for such an informative session, which is much needed. Thank you so much. Uh, many of the, my questions have already been answered, but uh, there's one in particular that I didn't, I didn't hear any reference to, 
Uh, so taking into account the effectiveness of this two wonderful program uh, and the impact that it has had in the police department, I'm interested to know what the size of the police department is and, and how much that was reduced by. There have not been reductions to our police department as the CAHOOTS program has expanded. Um, I don't have a firm number on total uh, employed officers for the Eugene Police Department or the Springfield Police Department. What I can tell you is if we look just at our services within the city of Eugene, um, where we're responding to you know, 17,000 calls per year and doing that on about a million dollar budget, uh, the Eugene Police Department operates at a budget of $68 million a year and handles about 100,000 calls for service. So you have no idea as to uh, the number of police officers? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up to date on the total number of officers that are employed by the, the two police departments we work most closely with. I could get back to you with that information. At a, All right. at a well, well, thank you so much. And also, I just want to uh, be mindful as well, and Council Wamala Fortune brought it up, which is the uh, demographics. Uh, Eugene, you're serving about uh, the 80% that are white. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that in Providence, uh, you got about 69%. Uh, uh, Providence is a minority majority city. Uh, there are non white. Uh, or in Eugene, you're serving, uh, uh, I believe it's about 1.6 blacks. Uh, in Providence, it's 16%. Uh, Latino, you serve 9%. Uh, here, uh, you're looking at a 43% Latinos. So uh, I have no doubt that the program is good. It works well. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious and, and mindful of when you shift the demographic on the same program, what the response will be and the effectiveness of it. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be mindful of that and maybe, uh, uh, I don't know, at this point, uh, it's something that we should keep in mind. Uh, yeah, you're, you're totally... You, you know, if I could respond to that, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, Eugene is a very white community. Um, the city of Springfield, just across the river, even much more so. Uh, and while for a long time we took for granted our service was reaching everybody, you know, in, in reality it was not. Uh, and in this moment, um, both culturally um, and, you know, for our program, receiving this level of recognition, um, we have taken this opportunity to spend more time listening than acting. Uh, and, and to really make sure that our services are actually accessible and responsive, you know, that they're equitable and that we're, we're limiting bias whenever possible. We are taking this time right now to learn from community leaders about what our program is missing. One of the key things that came out of that was that point of access. And so as I talk with other communities, I am really trying to stress that there, there needs to be a way for this to be part of public safety, but not be the police number that you're calling. You know, because we don't want to be asking people to call the police on themselves when they're in crisis. And that's what the CAHOOTS program has been doing for 31 years, is asking people to call the police on themselves. We need to, we need to find a different way to keep ourselves accessible within that emergency system without having the phone answered by, you know, by somebody at the police department. And so, you know, we're, we are really trying to learn from our community so that we can create something that meets the needs of our community. Um, and, and, you know, we are, you know, to that extent also building a, a consumer council where it's not just folks who receive services, but those same community leaders have a role where they can guide us in, a, in developing policy and making sure that as we implement programming, we are doing it in a way that is going to meet the needs of, of every member of, you know, the Eugene Springfield area. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Councilman Anthony. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to thank Rebecca, Daniel, and Tim um, for this really, really productive talk tonight. Um, I particularly want to thank Tim for uh, being very frank about where you would like to see this program move out of the public safety realm. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and so I really look forward to having a, a discussion about how um, I concur with uh, Councilwoman Miller, you know, taking taking pieces of each of these programs and, and aligning them and braiding them and coordinating them with things that we already have here in the 211 as program. And I think there's so many wonderful opportunities. So thank you so much. All set, Councilwoman? Okay. Um, Councilman Ankow. Thank you, Councilman. Chairman. 
Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Have the mic, sir. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Daniel, Rebecca, and Angie for being uh, a part of this call tonight. And uh, greatly appreciate having the opportunity to interface. Um, so Kahoot says the program saves the city about $8.5 in public safety costs every year. Uh, plus another, I believe it's $14 million in ambulance trips and ER costs. Can you provide a specific financial uh, example or just a, a broad breakdown as to how the city is able to save this money? Sure. Uh, so if, if we look at a situation where, um, you know, let's talk about, you know, cahoots versus police contact. Um, you know, let's, let's say we have an individual who's escalated and intoxicated. Um, they have had adverse experiences in other cities that they've lived in with police. Um, there's no cahoots response. That individual, you know, gets the police called on them and not because of interactions with those officers in Eugene, but because of interactions that they had with patrol when they were a kid in Seattle and when they were going to college in Nebraska, you know, they, there, there is an assumption that the encounter with police is going to become violent. And so this person who is intoxicated becomes escalated and engages physically with patrol as soon as they show up on scene because they are used to receiving that kind of treatment by officers based on their experiences as an individual. Um, that person gets lodged in jail for a week, um, you know, at a, at a cost of, I think it's $1,300 a night in jail. So right there, that week in jail is going to cost that person, you know, it's going to cost the, the community nine to $10,000. Um, that's without, you know, worrying about the legal fees that this individual is going to incur, the public defender that they're going to have, and then what's going to happen with that bench warrant when they're not able to make their court date because they're unhoused and can't track, you know, appointments. Um, you know, and so there's this whole cycle there. So that one interaction where Cahoots responding and taking that person to sobering is saving $10,000. Um, if, if we look at, you know, uh, even just the savings by somebody's going to get to the emergency room. It's non-emergent. They got to get there, but they don't need an ambulance. Cahoots taking them right there is a $1,200 savings just in the transport alone. If we can keep that person out of the ER, um, then we're saving another six or $700 on top of that. So, you know, when we talk about the return on investment for this program, between that $8 million to the, the city and public safety savings and that $14 million that we're saving in the hospital systems, you know, it's a really, it's almost a, a 10 to 1 uh, return on investment for, you know, what you're getting out versus what you're putting in. Got it. Great. Thank you. Uh, I recently read also of, of homeless people with mental health conditions, anywhere from uh, 62 to 90 percent of them will be arrested. Um, do you have any longitudinal data that you can share with us and about uh, how many people, um, if you do have this data readily available, um, uh, uh, of these people, and how many uh, people um, are being arrested and uh, also simultaneously, how uh, does your data show that uh, we can positively reduce arrest rates, uh, specifically amongst vulnerable folks who are homeless and, and those who have uh, mental health needs? Mm -hmm. I don't have that data readily available for you. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to the Oregon Law Center, uh, which has been spending a lot of time really looking into what are essentially quality of life offenses that are most commonly enforced upon folks who are unhoused uh, or, or members of other marginalized communities. Um, and uh, that's something that, you know, I think Daniel and I could work on getting back to this council. Um, I would need a couple of days, but I could, I could certainly get some information for you. Sure, great. Thank you for that. And uh, I think David Weiss, who's been very fundamental in spearheading your program, mentioned that partnership with police, this is a direct quote, has been essential to our model. Would you agree or, or disagree with that? I, yeah, I would, I would totally agree that partnership with police is what has allowed us to get to this point. Uh, it takes the trust of you know, both command and patrol officers to, to have civilians responding to situations that officers are expected to handle in, in every other city in the U.S. Um, you know, it takes, it takes a strong partnership for us to be able to speak up and say you weren't treating that person well. Um, you know, the things that you're saying uh, indicated that you have a very strong bias against them based on the color of their skin. Um, you know, just because we have a partnership doesn't mean that we always get along um, or that we're always friends. Um, but it has been invaluable to have 
that partnership in order to keep our responders safe uh, and for us to really be able to achieve systems change in our immediate community. Got it. And for a pilot, this is sort of a, a second piece of this question. Do you recommend a different dispatch from the onset or do you think that's essential to the model? I think connection to traditional public safety resources is essential to the model, um, especially when you're sending unarmed civilian responders out, you know, into crisis situations. That doesn't mean that the dispatch needs to be intimately tied to police, but for the program to be the most successful, there needs to be an efficient means for calls that originate with fire or the police to be routed to that CAHOOTS dispatch and for calls that are coming into the CAHOOTS dispatch that need fire or police response to be routed back the other way. So I, you know, um, in, in some communities, I think it would be very feasible for them to stand up their own dispatch independent of other public safety resources. But in smaller communities where, you know, money is an issue, there, there needs to be an avenue to have this service provided within traditional public safety. Great. So that being said, to my colleague, uh, Councilman Espinal and uh, Councilwoman LaFortune's point, um, race does play a key factor here. So, mm -hmm. you know, what race and culturally relevant training or anti-bias training are you doing with your staff so that they're appropriately addressing and meeting the needs of communities of color? Mm -hmm. We have regular, well, first of all, we, we spent the last eight weeks in, in weekly sessions on, on these topics um, moving forward. And, you know, previously it was something that was offered quarterly. Moving forward, it's going to be at least monthly. Um, but what we're doing is we're bringing in guest speakers from, you know, different communities that, that make up our cities. Um, but we also have established an ongoing relationship with some of our local leaders of Black Lives Matter uh, to, to ensure that, um, you know, that, that we're really just the best program we can be. And that has meant a lot of time, you know, sitting and, and, and examining our white privilege, um, you know, that has spent a lot of time looking at how simply being a part of public safety on any level is reinforcing white supremacy and, you know, uh, white male patri patriarchy in, in particular. Um, so, you know, I, I think would answer that, you know, we, we are constantly working on that and the, the relationships that we've developed with community organizations and, um, you know, with le within leaders within different communities in our city um, are, are coming to fruition now in some really powerful ways. And um, that's resulted in some systems change internally within the CAHOOTS program, within the Whitebird Clinic organization, um, you know, but also in, in how we've approached things like there was a, a defund the police petition that got 12,000 signatures in our community. Um, and the objective of that petition was to send $20 million to CAHOOTS um, without any sort of other money going to other services. And, and that's just ridiculous. We knew that wasn't going to pass city council. I mean, I mean, you all would, would laugh at something similar coming through, through your community right now. Um, but that opened the door for us to talk about what are the other services that are lacking? Where, where are the avenues for us to implement community mediation and restorative justice measures, increase access to mental health services, um, you know, increase non-English services across the board? Uh, you know, where, where are the other places that that money could be implemented instead of going just to enforcement? And you know, that opened the door for us to be able to talk with our chief about you know, this new objective that we have of developing our own dispatch console. Um, you know, so I, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. It's, um, there's, there's a lot that we're trying to accomplish right now. Councilman, do you have a follow-up? Uh, those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank I you have again. a, thank you. First of all, I, I want to thank, by the way, um, of course, all of you for accepting the invitation of the finance committee to come and talk about this. I think important issue this evening. We, I really appreciate it. My constituents do, and I know my colleagues do. So thank you very much. Um, it's been it's extremely informative. I have some follow-up questions on some of the stuff we talked about, if that's okay. One, I think you mentioned, I just want to make sure I got this right. So I guess in 2019, Cahoots responded to 24,000 calls. Is that correct? Yes, sir. 24,000 out of 124,000? Because it sounded like you said 100,000 calls were sent to the uh, police department and 20, was 24,000 to you folks? So 24,000 calls was our entire, uh, you know, response. And that, that's, that's operating in two cities. Um, we, how, I, guess, I guess the question is out of how many calls, you know, I mean, sure. my point is like 
it says, it says a total of 100,000 calls in total. Is it 24,000 or 100,000? You know, what's the, what's, gotcha. is it 24,000 out of 25,000? Which means then you're doing all the calls? I'm, I'm right. trying to understand. Right. Um, so that 24,000 calls, you know, annually is, is the combined call volume from our two cities. We have not been able to get the same partnership with the city of Springfield that we have with the city of Eugene as far as overall call volume. Um, in mm -hmm. Eugene specifically, which is where we have been doing this for the full 31 years, last calendar year we had 17,000 responses and that was out of a total of approximately 100,000 calls. So in, in Eugene specifically where we do have good, you know, good data, um, you know, that, that's very recent and relevant, we're, we're handling 17% of the call volume. So we're taking 17 okay. out of the 100,000. That's great. Thank you. I also, also want to come I want to start from the beginning. I was wondering is when this idea was emerging, was it White Birds Clinic's idea and they approached the city of Oregon or was it the city and folks put together and said, you know what, we'd like to do some kind of program like this and then they put an RFP out and then they took in, they took in bids and they applied a pilot program. Can you tell me what, or was it a combination of both? Could yeah, it was actually, yeah, it was, it, it was a combination of those factors. You know, the city of Eugene was looking for services to, um, you know, was, was looking to bring in more community-based services. Um, what they had in mind was likely something more along the lines of, of outreach teams. Um, Whitebird Clinic saw that RFP for, you know, supportive community-based services and said, hey, we have this bummer squad thing we've been doing on our own dime for, for 20 odd years, what if, what if you kind of broaden the scope of what you're hoping to accomplish with this RFP and we try this community-based crisis response? You know, so, so the city was looking for something, but, but we, they, didn't, they didn't know they were looking for us until we told them. Okay, so, so it sounds like Eugene had like all these kinds of services, like we have in Rhode Island, they're like all over the, we have all these different kinds. And we have a lot of nonprofits operating in all different kinds of pieces all over the place. Yeah. And then, you know what, let's try to do like a, you know, almost like have, you know, have a unit that, you know, call the fire, call police, let's call this, I'm calling it an emergency social service unit, let's have a unit. And what happened is that you folks at Whitebird Clinic, you brought together, said, okay, this is our proposal, this is how mm -hmm. we think we can address. And then they, so did they, did they also um, award it to any other proposal or was it just, were you guys the winning bid or the winning proposal? So we were the winning bid for, you know. for that proposal. I believe at the same time that we were funded, other uh, community service initiatives were also funded, which, which increased capacity for resources that CAHOOTS was then able to utilize in that diversion from jail and the hospitals. Oh, great. So then I did notice I mentioned, I, I know Ms. Gibble mentioned about the funding source between STAR and you folks, which is, you know, of course, you're based on a direct line item in, the, in that city budget, or those mm -hmm. two cities budget. And sounds like in Colorado, what they did was they did a tax. They added a tax, so it took a state legislature act, legislation, state legislation act to actually apply that. It's like kind of like your phone. You have a phone tax or 911. I'm sure everybody's mobile phone shows that. So they took a, a different route. They had a state action. They applied a state tax, and then they now are doing a program for the capital city. That's what it sounds like, right? So I believe so. That's that's one way we could go. I guess. Well, we're thinking about it and hope, uh, I, the idea like the city would create its own funding source and we would fund it, um, what do you call it? it would, we would create our own funding source and the city would then potentially put an RFP out. And I think I have Mr. Matini and, and Ms. Uh, um, Sinat from the um, Healthy Living um, Department, um, Healthy Community Office. And, and I guess the idea would be, what, you know, what could it be? And then they would end up identifying the source and then seeing what kind of programs and seeing how it would work. Um, so I, I just want to make sure I understand that's, that that's too fundamental. That's a big difference, which is we have to go to the state house and go ask for a tax versus do we wait for the state house or do we do, we do initiative on our own in the city of Providence and try to achieve something positive? So I guess that'll be a conversation the council can have and discuss if this is what they like, would like to do. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned also the difference, and I'm interested because I looked at, um, Ms. Gibble, when you send the information to the clerk, we're going to have ask staff if they would be able to join the conversation at, at the next, the, the soonest possible finance meeting to discuss their 
program. program. It sounds like their program just began June of this year. Is that right? Did you say? They're a brand new program, fresh off the right. They're brand new, so they're just they're just okay. This is what they think is the model that applies there. So they probably going to have growth teams too. What may work 10, 15, 20 years down the line. So right? so they so they're new system. Um, oh, can, might I might I add to that? Sure. Uh, they yeah. actually began this process in 2015. So this. So it took, this, it, so it, took them, it took them that long to kind of put together a particular model. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. And and the correct way from that model is, do they do an RFP or is it just all these non-profit social agencies are just doing a piece to the puzzle? Yeah, I'm not sure. Don't? That would. Chris would be able to speak to that more fully. Okay. It sounds like my point is Kahoot seems to be very. The Cahoots program is, is laser focus. It's like, it's a, and basically, I, and I am thinking of it as a third unit of the public safety, fire, police, emergency also service unit, right? And it's to provide a kind of, you know, that kind of a, a laser focus kind of issues and they're going to address it. Sounds like the star folks is doing more of a kind of a, 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 a wider net programming where they may or may not be doing like it's not going to be a unit that's going to go out like Cahoots is with a van and addressing it with the police, right? No, it is a unit. It is a crisis response unit. It's part of a larger. So the Denver Cares uh, Foundation, okay. they have what is it, thirty-six million dollars of funding, and they are funding a whole right. host of other programs. But the Star program specifically is in the Cahoots model. It's that it, it, third arm of, of public okay. safety. It's a crisis response team. Right now, okay. they have one van as part of the as part of the response, and they're doing uh, it's five days a week, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, with with one team that goes out. And the hope, the goal is to expand that to cover uh, all, uh, all of Denver. I know we're going to get those answers, but I just want to, do they get their calls from the uh, communications department too? It goes through 911. So they get, through the, so they get the call through 911, right? Okay. So yeah. I think the chief mentioned, Chief Taylor Constantine, he said the way the city promises 911 is there's a, a fire, uh, fire dispatchers and it's a police dispatchers. I believe in the, uh, is that right, Councilman Chief Taylor? That is correct, but also um, they're not. <laughs> that goes back to the uh, Annie and Howie that we don't have, but they, which I think Oregon has, and we also don't have um, fire and police. The fire, anyway, they they gave it up. Uh, do not do uh, CPR and uh, any first aid. Sure. And they're working on it, but they're not doing it. But our communications department is um, isn't run by the police department or the fire department, is that, or is it? No. It's run by communications itself. All right, so communications is a separate department unto itself, and they handle the communication. They, they handle all the calls, dis, calls coming in, and they dispatch them out to the appropriate police and fire. But right. I, it, it, sounds fall, like, it, fall, it falls under the commissioner slash acting fire chief. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, and then I, I was wondering, now let's talk about dispatchers themselves. When um, uh, Cahoots was... As what is happening now? Do the dispatchers um, do they get trained on a, identifying how to excuse me how to um, distinguish the different call? I guess it sounds like they must get tra additional. Do they get additional training, or they already have the training, or how does that work? And who does the training to them specifically? Okay, this is this is a cahoots call. Do that send it send it to cahoots. This is the police of the fire. Can you enlighten me a little bit, Mr. Black? Yeah, absolutely. Every employee of the, the Lane Lane County 911 Center is, is trained to handle police cahoots and, you know, fire calls. Uh, right now, we do not have our own call taker and dispatcher. That's something that we're working towards. Um, but even after that, in that separate console is stood up, we're still going to be sharing staff because what happens in the 911 Center is a, is a shift rotation where you'll do fire comm one day. So you're going to sit at this cubicle and then you're going to do, you know, police calls the next day. And so you're going to sit at a different cubicle and then you're going to be doing the police dispatch the third day, third cubicle. So every, every dispatcher, every call taker is trained on the full scope of services that are offered in our service area, which includes Kahoot. So we have our own section in the call taker training manual where call takers, you know, every new employee for that, that department is going to be trained on how to utilize Cahoots as a resource, how to screen, you know, how to triage those calls. We also 
host all of the new dispatchers for a ride along with Cahoots team so that they can get that firsthand experience about what it looks like after that call comes through the comm center and gets relayed to that Cahoots team out in the field, what happens out on scene. And that allows the call takers then to go back with that experience and say, yes, it's going to be a three hour wait. You know, the, the Cahoots team has four calls, you know, queued ahead of you that are all high acuity. Um, but when they show up, it'll be two folks in that white van. And I was out with them six months ago when I first started working here, you're going to be really happy when they show up. So, so we really try to make sure that that training is, is, you know, available to, to everybody in the comm center. Thank you. And I know you, you mentioned a couple of times about almost kind of like disconnecting from the police department. I'm just, a little, is, is this meaning like just basically becoming a third unit under the, the public safety umbrella, police, fire, and emergency, um, Social Service Emergency Response Unit. It, that is that what you're talking about? Where you would like to go? Yes. Because all you're talking about, you want to be like somewhere in, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know, in the Pox department. I don't, you know, what I'm saying I'm trying to, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused on what you mean by that. Mm -hmm. So, so what we mean is, is when when we talk about. Uh, what are, what are, who are the public safety departments in, in Eugene and Springfield right now? There's the police department and then there's the fire and EMS department. Um, Eugene, you know, the police department is also who is, is dispatching and overseeing the contract for cahoots right now. So, so what, what we're trying to do is get to a point where, you know, and, and we have strong direction and this is the, this is where we're, we're headed. It's just a matter of time where it then becomes, you know, cahoots, police and fire all on that same level. We're not in somebody else's pocket. You know, we're not using somebody else's dispatcher. It's that we have our own console and we are our own, you know, kind of independent entity within our public safety system. Thank you. Because that's actually what I was in my mind envisioning how, if anything, we should kind of model in Providence, which is basically under the, the public safety umbrella, but a mm. separate unit. So this way it's separate, but also has uh, excuse me, but it, it, it has communication, so this way I, you mentioned something interesting, which is um, you can do positive and negative feedback on interaction with police officers who come forward, which I think is right. good. So if you're a separate unit, let's say in Providence, let's say if we can, we can do this, let's say we can hopefully achieve something like this. Mm -hmm. And therefore, having that unit be a separate entity, uh, so, and independent, but under an umbrella, then they would have the ability to give the pros and cons on. Hey, well, even if a fire person shows up, doesn't interact correctly. I mean, it's not just the you know, just you know. Um, I know right now we're in this we're in a spectrum of either abolish all police or reform the police or do nothing. So it's on this kind of this wide spectrum. Um, I'm not at the abolish the police spectrum. I don't know. What that means, it seems to me, it is, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a fully thought out um, idea and what it means to businesses, et cetera. But I always believe that every police department, any department, by the city government, no matter what it's, what's the parks department, the license bureau, always is, is opportunity for reform and making it better, making it work better for the people they serve. It seems that the things that I did hear a lot about was, you know, we've heard over the years about you know, police officers not being, you know, ill-prepared to handle all the social, social ills, the social, social concerns. We hear that in the schools, right? We hear, like, we have these, we have this police officers in the school system. So we have people saying, take the police officers out, let's bring more social workers and guidance counselors in. Let them deal with them. And by the way, that makes sense, because those officers were never trained to be in those kinds of fields, right? So it's like, we keep on hiring electricians to do plumbing work, right? So... What I was envisioning is that we hire plumbers to do plumbing work, electrician, electricians, and you got the carpenters doing what they're supposed to do, right? So it seems that uh, it sounds like you're you're evolving. Cahoots' program is evolving, and the idea is to become a a, a more uh, a separate entity, yet separate unit under the um, uh, public safety division. Will you? It's the eventual goal is to also become actually a, a full-fledged city unit, like you know the police department. I'm calling, I'm calling it the emergency social service department cause, and the fire department. Is the goal to eventually be like that, that? Or is it always to be police, fire, and then it's a subcontractor, whether it's Cahoots, excuse me, whether it's, um, whether it's White Bird or let's say someone else in the future wins the bid. Mm -hmm. So what, what are you viewing? 
what what we're viewing is is kind of a hybrid where there is this stand this resource that is you know held on its on its own you know at the same level as police and fire um and some of that is because you know we see in situations like the the bird watcher in central park people will call with what they you know what what somebody wants to see in an outcome is going to inform how they present that situation when they're calling into public safety you know and so there needs to be you know, some sort of feedback loop for those calls that are um, misleading, you know, and presenting in details or, you know, that that turn out to be more appropriate for another resource. There needs to be a way for those calls to happen or those calls to be passed, you know, efficiently in the most efficient ways by having everybody utilizing the same comms system. Um, but as we've seen with the CAHOOTS program, there is success in having a nonprofit organization serve as the contractor to provide that service to the city, uh, you know. And and as we as we look at some of the different components of the kind of defund the police initiatives that are going around in cities across the country, one of the things that we're seeing in there is a desire for more community groups to be engaged in the the provision of public safety services. And so, you know, I, I would I would argue that Cahoots presents a potential hybrid of that traditional public safety resources as as different, you know components of city government and, and city resources uh, and and having that that contractor coming in who might have a better relationship with the communities that you're hoping to serve through that kind of program. So, um, uh, but they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? I mean, the bottom line, right. it seems that this program has a lot of merit, regardless of what the city does with its money, not money. It's like, it has a value, it has a big value, it seems, right? And it seems Absolutely. to be uh, it seems to be reaping a reward of positive impact to the community it serves as well as, well, you know, the community it serves and also financially, right? So there's like it's these multiple level of benefits, right? It's great. Um, so I did have, and I did mention, uh, I said, I, and I just in the follow up, we have uh, Ellen Sina from the, um, the, 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 the city's, the Directed Healthy Communities. Just so everybody knows that the, um, I've been talking to the administration, and the administration has been talking about some kind of program or something like this, trying to do a pilot program of some sort, but clearly, you know, we're still at the beginning stage. We have, we have to crawl before we can walk and before we can run. And also, you also don't want to set yourself up for failure instead of success. If we try to do too much at one time, it sounds like you just mentioned Stodge. It took them four or five years to kind of formulate what they wanted. It took you folks a few years to figure out what you wanted. So they kind of do a lot of crawling for us. Okay, they figure out how to walk. And now you're you're on you're the level of trying to perfecting it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like stars at the beginning, the very beginning stages of how, where they are and hopefully what's the impact. So, I mean, I, I, it's it's actually very, very enlightening, very exciting in a positive way. I have, uh, Ms. Sinai, did you want to weigh in a little bit and talk about what the administration's been thinking about and talking about on this particular issue? Sure. Thank you, Councilman, or thank you, Finance Chairman, and thank you for every um, all the time of the um, the presenters. My name is Ellen Sinar, and I'm the director of the City of Providence's Healthy Communities Office. Um, we're the coordinating body for the city's public health policy and promotion work. Um, we were created back in 2012 under executive order um, from former Mayor Tavares, and we um, we expanded upon the city's substance misuse prevention work that had been standing for. For many decades. Um, we primarily sit in the space of prevention. We are not um, a Department of Health from a state or federal entity, um, but as it relates to behavioral health, um, the connection to treatment, recovery, harm reduction services, and basic, basic social, social services um, we see as prevention. And so um, we have many relationships with behavioral health providers, um, peer recovery, um, uh, organizations and folks doing, you know, a wide range of work to address social issues in Providence. Um, I just want to flag that um, there are some clinical services that are already embedded within public safety. Um, the partnerships that the police department has with both Family Service of Rhode Island and the Providence Center um, are our existing relationships that um, you know have the potential to be built off of. Um, I know that a lot of the conversation um, that has happened tonight is really trying to steer away from the police engagement um, or public safety engagement. And I am encouraged by the conversation around um, 
uh, a potential for a mixture of both. Um, that there, you know, these are not mutually exclusive, but that, you know, there, there can be an opportunity for non-police engagement to address um, and de-escalate a lot of this work. Um, we have other behavioral health services in the state of Rhode Island. Um, BH Link, for example, um, Chief Kenyon, I'm glad that he's on the line, has done a lot of work to try and reduce um, or divert calls um, primarily from the emergency department and really get people to the services that they need. Um, the, the mobile health unit that he has worked on with Providence Community Health Center and um, in support, or with support of a neighborhood health plan, um, that's primarily a, a medical diversion or a more of a physical health diversion, less of a, um, a mental or behavioral health diversion, but still an important model of leveraging the relationships and partner, the, the resources we have in our community. Um, Chief Kenyon's also been um, a, a strong, strong champion for connecting people to um, treatment and recovery services for opioid use disorder or any substance use disorders through our Providence Safe Stations program. Um, so again, we have, um, we have on ramps or doors open for people who need services um, when they need them. Really that window of time could be 2 a.m. or 2 p.m. Um, it might only be for two minutes. And so trying to make sure that there's no wrong wrong door. Um, and again, you know, we have lots of partners in the community who I think are very interested in being engaged in this work and again, have a, a really wide portfolio of services that they, they can provide. Um, so I, I will stop with that, but um, we are here to be a partner in this work. We have um, a long history of, um, of contracting out services, of often piloting services or piloting programs and moving them into a more sustainable space. Thank you. Um, I know it's getting late in the hour, so I, first of all, I want to once again thank all the folks that were invited and attended this evening, of course, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Black, uh, uh, Ms. Gibble, um, Ms. Angela uh, Ancoma. I really appreciate you uh, attending, of course, council members, committee members, on, and also the public. You know, it seems this is like a really great start. I think we've learned an awful lot about this kind of program or kinds of programs. I look forward to having, hopefully we're gonna contact STAR and um, have the clerk um, contact them and making schedule a conversation with them. I think it's very fruitful. It, it clearly that a couple of things, I think. One, overall, is the question is, does the council and the body and the mayor, of course, do we wanna do something like this? And I think that seems to be as we hopefully coalesce and figure out what is it that we'd like to try to achieve, what kind of program, of course, what kind of funding and what kind of pilot, and where it's housing it will be left up for conversations in the near future, however you like it. I think, for me personally, well, however it looks or, or it's crafted, whatever it works, if it can achieve at least half of the success or more of the success that's going on with Cahoots and these other agencies for the city of Providence, in a positive fashion, I think it's it's a it's it's a win for all of us. All right, so I, I really I'm excited about this conversation. I'm excited about um, where we're going with this. If we hope we can get there, um, we got a little bit of a ride clearly. Um, but and where like I said, where it goes and where it's funding, we can all figure that out. I think that. Uh, those are uh, those are conversations we can have to figure out make it work. I I know the administration's working on uh, 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 reviewing and thinking of a proposal and ideas, and I look forward to continue collaborating with them. I know my council colleagues doing what the committee does. And I also, if I could also reach out to the the Cahoots folks and Mr. Anderson again and Ms. Ankin and Ms. Gibble, I we'd like to be able to reach out to you again for more advice and guidance if you'd be willing to do that for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And um, Ed, does any committee members have any final comments? Okay, then council members. And I just want to thank the administration. We're going to have more meetings, more conversations. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now have to ask the committee to do a motion to continue this item. And then we're going to continue the rest of the items. Do you have a motion to continue? Oh, no. Motion Second. to continue. Thank you. Councilwoman Castile, discussion. All in favor, aye. 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 We have a motion to continue items one through four. So moved. Second. Council Taylor, Council Steele. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Once again, thank you all. We have a motion to adjourn this. Motion this to meeting. adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Taylor. Discussion? All in favor? 
Bye. Bye. Thank you all.